About six years ago, something happened to me while I was home alone that I'll never forget. Because of this, I had to get therapy for five months straight, and this is why I will never stay home alone again. I was 12 years old at the time of this story, and this took place in my hometown in Weymouth, Massachusetts. It's a very small town, as there was nothing to do, and the antique design of the town made it look also boring and old. One weekend, my mom had told me that she had recently gotten a call back from a job that she applied to and that she had to go into Boston for an interview. She trusted me to watch over the house for a few hours while she was gone. With me being only 12, she went over the rules most parents tell their children when being left alone. Don't go outside, don't answer the door for anybody, etc. She then left in a hurry and I had the house to myself for a few hours until she got back. With nothing to really do or anywhere to go, I simply threw myself onto my bed and flipped on my TV to the cartoons. About an hour later, I go downstairs while on my way to the kitchen and I notice somebody standing in our backyard. He was facing off in the opposite direction with both of his hands in his pockets as if he were waiting for the bus. At first, I didn't get too worried as a few men had been coming by to fix a pipe on the side of the house that had a major leak. However, this guy looked nothing like a plumber or anyone who specializes in repairing pipes for that matter. He wore a black long-sleeved shirt, black pants, and a gray hoodie that surely covered most of his face. I don't even remember thinking twice about it. Anyway, I had went back upstairs and finished up my TV shows and decided to go take a shower as I had a birthday to go to later that night. I turned on the shower and go in for about 15 minutes. I take really long showers, so whenever I'm home alone, I go mental. After I was done, I turned off the water, and that's when I hear the front door open. My first thought was that it was my mom finally home from her interview, so I shoot her a text asking if she was home, and within a minute, she replies with, Hey honey, I just got finished with the interview. I'm driving home now. Is everything okay? That's when I get a sharp pain into the pit of my stomach knowing that someone was in my house. And it wasn't my mom. Why my dad isn't home is another story, but I take a deep breath to compose myself and wrap a towel around me and slowly creep down the steps and try and see who it was. Looking back, that was probably the most stupidest decision of my life. As I reached the bottom step, I peek around the corner and felt my blood run cold. There was a man about six foot six and looked to be in his mid-thirties standing in my kitchen. He was holding a large wrench in his hand and was looking directly at me as if he knew I was coming down the stairs. Then, very quietly, he said five words that still haunt me till this day. Run while you still can. That's when I lost it and started screaming while running up the stairs and into my room while locking the door. All the while, I began hearing footsteps coming up the stairs and stopping at my door. I knew he was there because I could see the outlines of his shoes at the bottom of the doorframe. He began banging on the door, loudly with a wrench demanding me to let him in. At this point, calling the police wasn't an option so I did the only thing I could do. I slowly opened my window and jumped out onto the patio floor. Even though I tried to break my fall, I still landed with some minor injuries. I felt as if a thousand pounds had been lifted off of me when I see my mom's car pull into the driveway. I run crying to her, explaining the situation, and she immediately takes out her 45 she keeps in her purse and walks into the house. I like to mention that my mom had served three years in the military, so she knew what she was doing. I heard two very loud gunshots from inside my room, followed by yelling and screaming. Police had been called by my neighbors who apparently had heard the gunshots and police then took this nightmare guy away. The look the man gave me as he was forced into the backseat of the police car was something that I'd never forget. It was a look of pure hatred and anger, like the first thing he would do once he got out of jail would be to come back for me. We had since moved out of that house a month later due to the constant paranoia I was having, which eventually made me have mental therapy as previously mentioned before. I don't know what the man's intentions were, but if he had a wrench with him, 
Chances are, he was probably planning on doing a lot more than just robbing us. My name is Danny, and this happened to me when I was living with my dad at the time of the story. My dad worked two jobs, and I was only 18 at the time and was a part-time college student, so my dad would oftentimes be called into work while I was either at home or school. This particular night, my dad had been called into work for one of his jobs for a possible storm emergency and wouldn't be back until the next day. This was during hurricane season, so him getting called into work wasn't too big of a surprise. Anyway, my dad had already left for work and I was laying on the couch watching a movie while somewhat enjoying the sound of rain and thunder from outside. At one point during the movie, I for some reason fell asleep and woke up to the sound of the home phone ringing. This wasn't too sketchy as we get calls almost every day, most of the time either from scammers or people looking for my dad through his work. I hesitated and got up to answer the phone and said hello, still in my drowsy state. However, the only thing I heard was a slight static from the other end of the line. The rest was just silence. Just as I was about to hang up the phone, I then heard what sounded like faint crying. I said hello one more time in the phone, and this time I got a response. There was a girl on the other end that sounded around 5 or 6 judging by her voice. She sounded distressed and scared. Then, clear as day, I heard these exact words. Help me. I've been taken. I've been missing for three years. I told her to stay on the line with me and then I dialed 911 from my iPhone. All I told the operator was just to listen. I asked the girl where she was located, but with her being so young she could only describe the house to be small and white. She explained that she was in a dark room left alone. All of a sudden, the sound of a door opening with force broke the silence and the girl began to scream before hanging up. The operator took down every little detail she tried giving us and thanked me for informing her. All the while, I was texting my dad about the situation and he told me to stay calm and call the cops again and give our address for further explanation. The cops did end up coming to my house, and I was being questioned for about half an hour before they finally left. The police never did find out who that little girl was, or where she was calling from, as it would have been very difficult to trace, but they did all they could. My heart aches for that child, and I hope she's doing alright, but I still have my doubts about that. Do you know how it's most teenagers dream to be left home alone by their parents for an extended period of time? Well, after what happened to me the first weekend that I had been left home alone, that was something I personally dreaded. You see, I had just started my sophomore year of high school, and I had always been a responsible kid, so when my parents' anniversary came around, they asked me if they could trust me to be alone by myself for two nights while they went on a small trip. I loved the idea, and at the time, I couldn't get them out of the house fast enough. The following week dragged on, but soon enough it was Friday, and I knew by the time I got home from school, my parents would have been gone, and I would have the house to myself. The first thing I did when I got home was turned on the TV and grab my laptop to start contacting my friends. I didn't want to throw a party that weekend, but I definitely planned on having a few friends over to watch some movies and enjoy the empty house. I logged into Facebook and saw that no one was online so I figured I would check back in an hour or so. I figured to pass the time, I would watch some South Park and scroll through Reddit. As I was sitting on the couch, the hours began to pass and I hadn't heard from any of my friends. I figured they were just busy though and I would hear from them later. I began to make dinner for myself. I was just going to make some pasta and sauce, but before I could even turn the burner for the stove on. I heard a knock at my door. I paused for a moment and was curious as to who might be knocking when I heard it again. Only this time the knocking was a lot louder and I figured it was just one of my friends that probably decided to just stop by unannounced. I yelled out for whoever was knocking to hang on and told them that I would get to the door in a second. I made my way out of the kitchen and down the small hallway that led to the front door. The person on the other side was still pounding on it. 
I yelled louder for them to stop and told them that I was coming to answer the door. Before opening it, I decided to look through the peephole just to make sure it was actually one of my friends on the other side. But when I got a good look, I tossed myself away from the door. Standing on my front porch was a full-grown man who appeared to be covering his face with a ski mask or hat of sorts. Before I could react any further, I heard a smashing sound from the other side of my house. Someone had broken through the sliding door in the kitchen. I tried to run through the hallway and get into my room so I could hide away, but before I could make it ten feet, the person who had broken through the kitchen door already had their hands on me. I was thrown into the wall and then onto the ground. The intruder bound my arms behind my back and tied them together with rope they had brought with them. And after opening the front door for his accomplice, the two walked over to my basement stairs and tossed me down. I hardly felt it as my head bounced off multiple stairs on my way down. As I was laying on the cold concrete floor, I could hear the sound of men rummaging through my house above me. They were only inside for what seemed like 15 or 20 minutes before I heard them both running out of the front door. I tried my best to get up, but any time I got close, I would get dizzy and drop back to the floor. I ended up being trapped on my basement floor for the entire night before I was finally found. My parents called the police after I didn't contact them the night before or that morning and asked them to stop by and check on me. After my parents found out what happened, they rushed back from their trip and met me at the hospital. I was fine aside from a mild concussion, but the thieves ended up getting away with more than six grand worth of jewelry and electronics from my parents' room. As far as we know, the intruders were never found. The summer after I graduated from high school, my parents had planned a trip for them to visit my aunt. During that time, they had agreed to let me stay home and have a small party with just a few of my friends to celebrate a successful school year. The party went off without a hitch. There was no funny business, and when it was time to clear out and go home, everyone listened to me when I told them to leave. All in all, I thought the night was a success. That was until... I went up to my room for some sleep. I was pretty tired, so after cleaning up a bit, I decided to leave the rest for the morning, and I would handle it all after waking up. I made sure to lock all the doors, and I went upstairs to go to sleep. I knew I was tired, because I was asleep within two minutes after my head touched the pillow. It was like turning off a light. Sadly, as quickly as I fell asleep, I was woken up. My eyes shot open as I heard the sound of something slamming downstairs. I knew something had fallen, but I couldn't think of what it could have been. I mean, I was home alone, so I didn't know what could have fallen on its own. And that was when I realized it. Someone else must have been in the house with me. I did my best to stay silent and listen as closely as I could. And sure enough, I could hear the sound of one or more people walking around downstairs. I assumed it was just some kids from the party who hadn't heard me tell everyone to go home, so I figured I would just call out to them. I got out of bed and walked over to my door. I cracked it open and yelled, Hey, the party's over. Everyone went home. Suddenly, there was silence. I could tell that something wasn't right. Out of nowhere, I could hear the slamming of footsteps as whoever it was began running through my house and towards the staircase. I didn't even think. I closed my door and ran straight for the window above my bed. I had used the window to sneak out of my house before, so I knew how to get in and out of it quickly. I slid right through it and onto the roof of my house. As I turned back, I could see my door handle moving as if someone was struggling to open it. I turned and began to make my way down the side of my house and ran across my yard into my neighbors. After pounding on the door for a minute, they came running out. I informed them about the intruders in my house and they told me to come inside and they would call the cops. While we waited for them to arrive, we were shocked to see three different people fleeing from my house. None of them appeared to be carrying any stolen property, which either means they didn't find anything worth taking, or that they were there for a more violent reason. 
Since the incident, my parents have installed security cameras along with an alarm system. Luckily, we have never had a similar situation occur. Growing up, I had to get used to my dad pranking me, which is why, when he called me to tell me not to answer the front door as I was watching TV, I thought he was just messing with me. My phone rang, and that was the first thing he said, don't answer the door. I froze for a moment, but then began to laugh because I assumed he was just trying to freak me out. But when the doorbell rang, things got increasingly more serious. My dad must have heard the bell on the other side because he very firmly said, don't go to the door. I asked him what was going on because I could tell how serious he was being. And he told me that he wasn't sure, but the police were on their way. At that point, I was both shaking with fear, but very curious as to what was going on. The doorbell rang again, and I figured I could peek out the window and see who was there. I leaned over my couch and slowly moved the curtain out of the way, and my dad must have heard me gasp because all he said was, Hey, you're gonna be okay. The police will be there soon. Just don't answer the door. And I wish that made me feel better. But outside my house, there were at least three men all dressed up in clown clothing and carrying what looked like weapons. I could see two of them standing on my porch, while another was walking around my yard. I told my dad that I was scared, and that was when the ringing of the doorbell turned to slamming on the door. I couldn't tell if they were knocking really hard or trying to kick it down. I began to panic, and as I turned away from the window that was facing the front of my house, I screamed, standing on the other side of my house with his face pressed against the window was the third clown. He waved his hand slowly as we made eye contact. The slamming at the front door grew louder and louder, and my dad tried to calm me down, though he knew there was little to be done until the police arrived. Thankfully, I could hear the sound of sirens in the distance. Sadly, so did the men trying to break in. The three of them quickly ran off my property and down the road away from the sirens. Once the police arrived, I unlocked the door and let them in. We explained everything to them, and they let us know that we weren't the only call that they had gotten like this in the past few months. Apparently, these three had been terrorizing people in the surrounding area for a few months before I had a run-in with them. This happened to me when I was in my early years as a teenager. I was 14 years old, and I was staying at my grandma's house for the weekend as she had lived far from us at the time and we didn't see her often. She lived way out into the country, and for some reason she didn't drive even though it seemed convenient for her, especially living isolated. One day, my grandma told me that she was going to her local grocery store to pick up a few things and asked if I wanted to come. The grocery store was about a six mile long walk from my grandma's house. And with me being a lazy and boring kid, I refused and figured I'd just watch some shows on TV. My grandma was 84 at the time, and surprisingly, as old as she was, she still had a lot of strength in her, which is why she took long walks. Fast forward a few hours later, it was now past 6 and the sun was starting to set. I was on the TV watching a Spongebob episode, when I hear what sounded like faint laughing coming from outside. I lowered the TV to see if I could hear it again, and when I did, I could confirm that there was indeed somebody out there. However, there was something very off-putting about the laughing. It was hard to describe, but I remember it sounding like a little girl's laugh with no language skills. It was freaky as hell, and I got up to look through the windows to see if anyone was out there. But to my surprise, there didn't seem to be anyone. My instincts told me to call out to whoever was there, or at least open the door, but I was naturally afraid at this point. Five minutes go by, and I didn't hear the laughing again, so I quietly opened the door to see if anyone was there. 
Nothing. The very second I took one step outside, I hear the laughing almost instantly coming from a big tree, much more louder than before. I didn't even dream of looking behind that tree to see who was there. All I did was go back inside and lock all of the doors and continued watching my show. I have yet to hear that laugh since, and I haven't told anyone else about this. Till this day, I still wonder what would have happened had I walked over to that tree to see who or what was there. When I was 15, I moved in with my aunt and uncle as my parents had recently gotten separated due to reasons I won't go into. Therefore, my aunt and uncle took me in to go live with them. Both my aunt and uncle worked in the medical field at the time, and their shifts would often change from time to time, meaning I would be home alone for some time. My uncle never got me a babysitter, as he didn't baby people and figured as long as he trusted me that it would be fine to let me stay alone. One evening, both my aunt and uncle were doing their nightly routine of working while I was at home watching a movie trying to take a nap on the couch. For some reason, I always had a hard time falling asleep on nights like this, so I probably laid there for about a good half hour or so when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. I turned to my left and saw a man looking through our window. Our living room window is massive, you might as well consider it as a glass wall. Now we have an alarm system, but the only time the alarm goes off is if the glass breaks and I couldn't move to call the police as our home phone was located in the kitchen and I didn't want to be spotted by him. Of course, I immediately freeze and try not to be noticed, but it seemed as if he didn't know I was there. He was not a pleasant looking man. I saw craze in his eyes, indicating that he was on something, but I still laid there watching him. He wore a black jacket and some torn jeans, and his hair was a mess. As nice as our neighborhood was, we had a few homeless people roaming the area. Eventually, after taking several looks inside, he walked off into the trees, and that's when I noticed sticking out of his bright pocket was a handgun. I ran upstairs into my room and stayed up there for the remainder of the night. I told my uncle about this and I remember him going out the following week to install a camera system. A little bit of context as to what made this story absolutely terrifying. When I was around 15, my family and I moved into a big two-storied house that was built back in the 80s. Even though the house was fairly odd, it was still a decent sized house appropriate for a family of four. The only problem I had about it was the blatantly obvious antique design of the house. It was nice, but the design gave off such an eerie vibe to us kids and we didn't exactly know as to why. Anyway, one night, my parents had gone out to dinner for their 10th anniversary and I was home watching over my little brother Kevin who was only two at the time. During this time, we were still in the process of unpacking our things into our new rooms, so we slept down in the den for the time being. I slept on a cot, while Kevin slept in his crib. I'd say that we were both fast asleep by 10, when I woke up to Kevin crying his eyes out. Normally when he cried, he most likely wanted a snack or something, but that immediately checked out when I saw him pointing at the open door that led into the pitch black basement. I'd say right then and there, I started feeling extremely cold, which didn't make sense as this was during the summer and her AC was broken. I had this negative energy around me, like a sense of dread. Then, clear as day, I heard the sound, the sound of a child laughing. <laughs> I grabbed Kevin and brought him upstairs with me and we slept in the living room couch for the remainder of the night. Till this day, I truly believe that what we experienced that night was completely paranormal. I never found anything in that basement the next day. I'm 27 years old now. 
This happened when I was 13, my sister was 9, and my brother was 6. We were raised by our single mother. She usually worked nights on the weekends. I was old enough to be home alone, so whenever my mom was at work, I was the one responsible for my siblings. This all happened on a Saturday night. For a little bit of context, let me give you the layout of my childhood home. When you walked into the living room, there was a hallway. To the right was the kitchen. Then straight ahead was the downstairs bathroom. To the left was the stairway. Once you got upstairs, the first room straight ahead was the upstairs bathroom. The first room on the right was my room, and the second room on the right was my brother's. The room across from mine was my mom's, and my sister's room was right next to my mom's. Now here's the story. Before my mom left for work, she had gave me $20 for pizza, then left. I ordered the pizza and we had a good night. About two hours after we ate, my sister went to the downstairs bathroom. When she came out of the bathroom though, she said that she heard someone knock on the window. I believed her and I told her that it was okay. Well, about an hour later, we heard yet another knock at the front door. I looked in the people and I saw a dirty looking man with long brown scraggly hair. He looked like he was homeless but I couldn't really tell. I then began to look down and I saw that he had a knife right in his hand. I then looked at my brother and I told him to turn off the TV and all of the lamps. I told my sister to grab my flip phone while I ran in the kitchen to grab a knife. I then told all of my siblings to go upstairs. I told my brother to go hide under his bed and my sister to go hide in my mom's closet. I then hid in the upstairs bathtub. I then heard the front door smash open. It was a really flimsy old door so it didn't really surprise me that that happened. I then heard doors opening downstairs. I started to dial 911. I heard the man start to come upstairs and then heard the bathroom door open. I held one hand over my mouth while the other was holding my flip phone. Very luckily, he didn't open the shower curtain. When the man left, I had started to worry about my siblings. I then got out of the bathtub and ran out of the bathroom. I began to run full force at the guy, stabbing him a few times. Right as this was happening, the police had finally arrived. I saw him trying to run out the front door, but the police were able to catch him. I then found my siblings and the police called our mom. My mom came home immediately. She even quit that job because of this. So yeah, that's definitely the scariest thing that's ever happened to me while home alone, but hopefully the last. I'm currently a 15 year old female, but I was around 11 at the time of this event. It was mid-December in West Virginia, and there was a thin layer of snow on the ground, and I was home alone while my entire household was at the local Walmart. I didn't go because I had a terrible fever, but regardless of the fever, I typically stayed home anyway. I've always had some sort of social anxiety, and I've never really liked being in a crowd of people, with the fear that I'd be judged. Now starting the story... It had been about 15 minutes after my family left and I was sitting on my bed with my protective pit bull. Keep that in mind because it's a really important part of the story. I was watching some show on my laptop when out of the corner of my eye, I saw what looked like a human shape then very quickly passed my window. I tried to brush it off while attempting to rationalize the incident, but I had a gut feeling that something was wrong. Disregarding my gut feeling, I directed my attention back to my show, when about 5 minutes later, my dog jumped off my bed and then started growling while looking in my window. I didn't really think too much of it at first, knowing that she often growled at deer when they passed my window, but then I thought about what I saw before and then pretty much instantly I felt my stomach go numb. I slowly walked up to my window to see if anything was there, and at first glance I didn't see anything. Then my heart sank. I then looked across the snow and saw boot prints. Boot prints leading to my window. I was terrified at this point, scared to look down. But still, I slowly let my eyes venture downward 
And to my horror, right below the window pressed up against my house, I saw a man. He was about six foot from what I could tell, with dark brown hair, a beard, and dark green eyes, and he was wearing a snowsuit. He then looked up at me, and the both of us were frozen in fear. We made eye contact for about 10 seconds, but that 10 seconds felt like forever. As soon as I snapped into realization, I grabbed my phone and ran as fast as I could up the stairs and then into my bathroom. I could still hear my dog growling and loudly barking, but I didn't care. I decided to call my mom. Stupid, I know. I should have called the police instead, but I was just so scared and the only thing making me feel safe was the sound of her voice. As soon as she picked up the phone, she heard how stressed I was and just how frightened my voice sounded. I explained the situation and she told me she was sending the police and that she would be heading home ASAP. Well, everything was starting to smooth out. Although I was still shook, I was feeling more comfort now. But then everything came crashing down when I then heard glass begin to shatter. I thought I was going to pass out. I was shaking so violently and I couldn't think straight. The next sound that followed up was a screaming. Just very loud, blood-curdling screams. And that's when I realized it. My dog was attacking him. I was still so scared shitless, but felt a sense of happiness. Soon I heard my door being broken down, while my mom and the police officers came into the house. My mom came up to the bathroom, and I let her inside. I think I can honestly say that that was the most safe I'd ever felt in my mother's arms. She walked me downstairs and I could see the guy being taken out in handcuffs, crying and covered in blood. My dog then came barreling into me, licking my face and jumping all over me. I could tell right away that she knew she had done right. I still have the same dog. Her name is Metallic and she's 8 years old. She still acts like a puppy though. I will forever love that dog and she's probably the reason I'm here today. Okay, so it was finally my turn to take my kids trick-or-treating. The previous year it was my wife's and we trade back and forth like every year. My son and daughter are age 7 and 9. Usually I stay on the street while my kids go to the different houses to collect candy. After about a half an hour of walking around, we came to one of the more popular hotspots for candy collecting. A main street right in the neighborhood. Lots of really cool decorations and animatronics on people's lawns. So I became a bit distracted and I stopped watching my kids closely. At one point they had came back from a house accompanied by another girl about the same height as my daughter. She was wearing a really weird homemade mask, like some kind of cardboard cutout or something. My daughter then asked if she could go trick or treat with us. So I said sure and we carried on together as a group. I didn't know who this girl was, but I figured she was just a friend from school or something. As we continued, I started to notice a really large man trailing us. He was wearing some sort of angry cat mask. It was kind of creepy to be honest. I thought that maybe he was the father of the girl, so I tried to start up some small chat with him. I think I said something like, um, nice weather, huh? But he didn't respond. He just stood there staring at me while our kids went up the stairs to the next house. I tried again, then asking, Hey, is that your daughter? He then nodded, but he still didn't say anything. I figured he just wasn't in the mood for chatting, so I just stopped trying. We carried on for about another 15 minutes until suddenly my kids came up to me and said that they wanted to go home now. This really surprised me as we hadn't even been out for too long, and I mean their bags were only about a third full. In any case, I agreed. We then waved goodbye at the man in the cat mask as well as his daughter and then started on our way home. The really weird thing is that when I glanced back at the man and his daughter, they were just standing there staring at us. I went to check one more time as we turned the corner, and they were still standing there, not having moved at all. At this point, I decided to ask my kids. So, um, who was that girl? My daughter then looked up at me with a really confused look on her face. 
she's your friend. My daughter replied. Pretty confused, I asked her what she meant by that. Apparently the girl with the cardboard mask had approached my kids and said that she was a friend of mine. She then went on to tell my daughter that she was too shy to ask me if she could join us to trick or treat, and apparently she wanted my daughter to ask me instead. I laughed at the story and then replied to my daughter, why would you think she was my friend? I don't have any children friends. What my daughter said next absolutely chilled me to my bones. According to her, when the girl with the cardboard mask approached them the first time, she wasn't even wearing the mask, so they were able to see her face. As it turns out, she wasn't a girl at all, but actually an older woman around my age with wrinkles on her face. What's even more disturbing is that the old woman had started to steal treats from my daughter's bag apparently when I wasn't looking and this is why they asked me to go home. This strange old woman was creeping them out and they just wanted to get away from her. I brought my kids home and I told my wife what happened. We made absolutely sure to check through all their candy, but we never found anything suspicious or off. We didn't call the police or anything since, I mean, nothing really happened. But looking back on it, I really kind of regret that decision now. What the heck was that old woman doing, and who the hell was that man that was following us around? I don't think I'll ever know. I find it really sick that there's people out there on Halloween hiding behind masks pretending to be children. It's just sick. This happened almost a decade ago when I was 13 years old. I remember my friend and I were really excited about our first time trick-or-treating without our parents. We lived in a small town where nothing ever really happened, and we thought it would be the same that night. It started like any other Halloween night. We collected candy, ran into many of our classmates, and had a lot of fun. At about 8pm, we realized we had to head home, but on the way back, we dropped by our teacher's house. She wasn't home and the street didn't really have many street lights. To add to this, most of the houses had their lights turned off as well as their Halloween decorations being taken down. My friend and I were slightly spooked and really disappointed by the lack of candy. We wanted to get out of that street as soon as possible. That's when a man then emerged from under one of the street lights. It was a police officer. Neither one of us seemed to have noticed him before this, possibly due to the darkness. He really startled us, but he seemed really friendly. The cop introduced himself and then pointed to an inconspicuous bungalow. He said an older man living in this house was apparently inviting trick-or-treaters inside. Someone called the police, but when he arrived, no one was answering the door. He then kept telling us that his police car and partner were just around the block. We started to look around, but we couldn't see them. I was a pretty paranoid kid. Growing up, my mom always really loved watching crime shows, and she would always tell me these little tidbits of lessons. Well, one of these happened to be a story about fake cops. Although I don't really remember the details, I remembered that people can pretend to be police officers in order to gain trust. Throughout this whole exchange, I was terrified. His lack of badge, police car, and partner just didn't feel right to me. I was also really conflicted because he was smiling, and he seemed like he just really wanted to help us. That is, until we then heard his really strange request. He said he needed to speak to this potential predator, and he needed our help. Since we were young girls, the man would answer if we knocked. The officer claimed that he would hide behind the bushes next to the front door. He would wait for him to invite us in, jump out, and then catch him red-handed. Right at that moment, I knew that my friend felt the same way that I did. Now, we both fell silent, but one of us managed to ask if we could talk it out. The cop said yes, but told us we had a limited time. The street was silent, and he could hear everything. I remember the feeling of wanting to say something, but fearing he would hear us and then escalate the situation. We kind of just stared at each other for what felt like forever. The cop was getting increasingly impatient, and he told us we had to decide quickly. 
Around that moment, a family came down the street and noticed the officer. They were coming over to see what was happening. That's when the cop said that he'd be right back and did not go anywhere. My friend and I then scrambled to collect our thoughts and we decided to run away. We sprinted out of the street and we didn't look back. On our way back home, we had discussed theories that ranged from him being a fake cop, him playing a prank on us, or maybe him being a real cop, but we misunderstood the situation. When we told our parents, we downplayed it a lot and doubted our experience. In the end, we didn't call the police, but our dad drove to the house as well as the area around the house. No cop cars or police officers were in sight. Over the years, I can definitely say I regret not calling the police. I mean, at the time, my friend and I were just convinced that we both misunderstood what happened. We even told our class the next day, and most, including our teacher, thought it wasn't alarming. Looking back, I find it extremely strange that a police officer would put two children in such a potentially dangerous situation. I really wonder what his motives were, but unfortunately, it'll remain unsolved. I guess that's just how it is. Happened back in 2015. Let's get the obligatory backstory out of the way. I'm the eldest of three brothers. At the time, my brother Eli was 7 and Danny was 12, and I had just turned 17 a week prior. My parents have always been a couple of party animals. Whenever the holidays would come around, they would always go out and have a few drinks with friends, leaving us home with a babysitter until I was about 14. Then it became my responsibility to watch after my younger brothers. There was this girl who was my age named Shelly who lived across the street from us. She had a brother named Charlie who was the same age as Eli and they were very good friends. I used to have a crush on Shelly but I never said anything to her because of the usual teenage awkwardness that we all go through. By the time I grew out of that stage, Shelly had already been through a few boyfriends. Now, I don't mean to sound mean or anything, but Shelly had horrible taste in men. She would always go for these wannabe gangster types. The type of loser who you'd see arguing with the desk clerk at the DMV. It was like these dips came off an assembly line or something. I swear, she'd drop one loser only to get with another guy who was exactly like the one she just dumped. Anyways... By the time I turned 17, I had gone through a pretty drastic physical transformation. I was much taller and stronger than most kids my age. My father is a very big man, 6 foot 4, 240 pounds, and it seemed that I was shaping up to become just like him. When I started becoming bigger, Shelly started coming around more and more, flirting with me and whatnot. I was always nice to her for the most part but I honestly had no interest in being in a relationship with her at that point. I mean, after seeing the kind of trouble she brought around. She was one of those girls who thought bragging about how she hung out with gang members and smoked weed was just so full. I found it to be repulsive and annoying. So the day before Halloween, I was working on fixing my dad's lawnmower. It had been giving us some trouble lately, and I was checking out the motor to see what the issue was. I was working in the garage and had the garage door open. It was simply just way too hot to be inside the garage with the door closed. I can't remember the exact reason, but I was in a bad mood that day. So when I looked over my shoulder to see Shelly standing there in a really skimpy outfit, I just instantly became aggravated. Hey, Mike. She had said in an irritating, seductive voice. I let out a groan under my breath before I responded. What's up, Shelly? Can I help you with something? Oh, I was just wondering if you wanted to go somewhere and have a little fun. Um, no thanks. I think I'm good. (laughs) Stop playing. I've seen the way you look at me. I don't know what you're talking about. Now, if you don't mind, I'm busy. At this point, I was beginning to lose my patience. Don't be that way. You know you want this. The only thing I want is for you to get the hell out of my garage. Isn't there some other head you can bother? I couldn't believe I said those words as they left my mouth. 
I'm usually much nicer to her, but this was the first time she had ever come on to me. I knew it was going to happen sooner or later, but I didn't really plan on being so aggressive when I turned her down. Are you kidding me? You're turning me down? Um, yeah. Can you please leave now? You idiot. You're gonna regret this. I just shook my head as I watched her stomp off. I didn't take her threat seriously. I just chalked it up to her not being able to handle rejection well, and then went about my day. The next night was of course Halloween. My parents were invited to an adults only party. They told me that I was to take my brothers trick or treating and to not wait up for them as they wouldn't be back until the next day. So I did what I was told and I watched over Danny and Eli as they walked from house to house collecting candy. After about an hour, we saw a little boy in a ninja costume standing in the street. The boy was crying his eyes out and asking where his sister was. To my shock, the boy was Charlie, Shelly's younger brother. I asked him what happened. Charlie said that he was trick-or-treating with his sister and that when he got back from getting candy from the house across the street, which had a really long driveway, his sister was nowhere in sight. I was pretty much instantly worried. I thought something might have happened to her, so I immediately called Charlie's mother, Shauna. Shauna was enraged upon hearing that Charlie was all by himself. She went on to say that her and Shelly got into this huge fight earlier that day because Shelly wanted to spend the evening with another boyfriend instead of taking her brother trick-or-treating. She suspected that Shelly ditched her brother then ran off with her boyfriend. I didn't want to get involved with this family drama, but I offered to watch after Charlie and take him trick-or-treating with my brothers around the neighborhood. Charlie and Eli were buddies after all. Shauna thanked me and she said that she would deal with Shelly as soon as she found out where she was. I thought it was pretty shitty for Shelly to ditch her brother and run off with some guy, but it wasn't my problem. I was just going to make sure that Charlie had a good time and then got back home safely. However, I was not prepared for what happened later that night. The rest of that evening was pretty uneventful. Being around Danny and Eli seemed to really cheer up Charlie. Charlie was a good kid. I'm glad I was able to save his Halloween experience and distance him from the chaos that was undoubtedly waiting for him back home, at least for a time. I would say around 9 o'clock was when we dropped Charlie back off at his house. Shauna answered the door and thanked me for looking after him. I could tell she was very upset about the situation. Me and my brothers came back home and after watching a horror movie and going through the candy, I then made them wash up and get ready for bed. After the boys fell asleep, I settled down in my room and began going through my phone. Just as I was starting to nod off, I was then startled by a really loud smack at my bedroom window. I could hear a muffled voice coming from the other side. I couldn't make out what was being said, but I clearly heard a male voice saying the word mother multiple times. Don't ask me how, but I just somehow knew what was going on. Now, you may be thinking that someone may have been trying to break in, or maybe some psychopath was lurking around the backyard with a knife, but I promise you what was actually going on is much dumber than you could possibly imagine. I recognized the voice that was outside my bedroom window. It belonged to a guy named Derek. He used to go to my school, but he was expelled for dealing drugs in the bathroom. A real winner. He, of course, had an on and off relationship with Shelly. As I said, I knew why he was outside my house knocking on my window. I believe that Shelly had reached out to him after I turned her down and concocted some bullshit story about me being rude to her or something, and this dork had the audacity to come and provoke me at my home. I have a zero tolerance policy for anyone who comes to my home looking for trouble. I calmly got up and walked to my back porch and saw Derek looking right into my bedroom window, which was next to the porch. Shelly was standing behind him with her arms crossed. I opened the door and stepped out into the back porch. As soon as I did, I was assaulted by a freight train of insults from the two delinquents. Derek had a pocket knife in his hand and was walking up the porch steps towards me. As soon as I saw the knife, I immediately sprung into action. I rushed right for him and shoved him backwards off the steps. He then hit the ground hard. 
before he even had a chance to get up. I was towering over him and hitting him in the face with a closed fist. After about the second or third blow, I could see that he was out cold. Blood was gushing from his nose and mouth and he was twitching really badly. I knew if I continued pounding on him, he'd be drinking through a straw for the rest of his life and I really didn't want that on my conscience. I got off of Derek and looked over to Shelly who was standing there with a look of absolute shock all over her face. I was so disgusted with her and I gave her some parting words. Did you seriously ditch your brother tonight so you could get with this idiot and come after me? You're so pathetic. Get the hell off my property. I'm calling the police. It wasn't until I turned around and started walking back up the porch steps that Shelly started shouting at me. I know gang members. They're going to come back here and kick your ass. When I turned back around, there were two police officers that appeared behind Shelly with their guns drawn. Shelly was still shouting at me, completely unaware that the cops were literally right behind her. All I could do was smile and fold my arms and watch as Shelly's face turn completely pale when one of the officers then told her, Shut up and put your hands in the air. After everything was said and done, Derek was taken to the hospital with a concussion, a broken nose, and several missing teeth. He would face trespassing charges as soon as he recovered. Shelly was kicked out of her house for the stunt she pulled that night, and I haven't seen her since. I do sincerely hope that she learned a lesson that night and that she's turned her life around for the better. There's a couple of more things I'd like to say before the story ends. The first is that if you have younger brothers or sisters, you should make sure they enjoy their Halloween, even if that means you have to cancel your own plans. Halloween is a very special night for children, and there's only a handful of years they have to really enjoy it. The second is that if you show up at someone's house with a knife threatening them, you better have a good dental insurance plan. Me and my buddies used to trick or treat like every year when we were kids without fail. And there used to be this one house that we always used to go to where this horrible family used to live. Like their kid was a huge bully in middle school, got suspended a bunch of times and their parents didn't seem to be any better. Like most kids would just stop going to that house after they'd been told to buzz off year after year but we grew to kind of relish the confrontation in a way. Like it's not like the mom who used to answer the door knew exactly who it was each year. We had masks on. We're different stuff. We just got a kick out of seeing her get increasingly irate as the years went by. Only one year in particular she gets really really angry with us knocking over and over and actually chases us down her driveway and out into the street which wasn't nearly as fun as just trolling her and seeing her get all angry. So that year, we decided it was time for the nuclear option. You see, we were heavy on the treat side of trick-or-treating, not so much the tricking sides of things. Even houses that told us to get lost or had ran out of candy didn't get anything bad thrown their way, we just sort of took it on the chin. But that time, getting chased away was a little too much for us to stomach, so we started hatching a revenge plot. One of us runs back to their parents' place, grabs a pack of toilet paper, then meets back up with us like a few minutes walk away from the house we planned to TP. We head back over there like we're on a secret mission or something, all hyped up to strike deep at the heart of killjoys everywhere. It was dumb, but we were just kids, maybe only like 12 or 13 at the time, so I guess being dumb was just part of the package of being that age. Anyways, we get there, sneaking up the driveway in pairs, hiding behind bushes and the car and whatnot, getting in position to strike. Then, like some little team of cartoon commandos, one of us gives the signal and we spring into action, hurling the rolls of toilet paper over the house, over the car, into the big tree that they had in their front yard, everywhere we could. Then boom, there's a gunshot and the dad of the family runs around the back of the house, aiming a pistol in the air and hurtling towards us. He looked like a man possessed, sprinting towards us at terrifying speed, despite the fact that he was rocking a big old spare tire in his gut. We just bolt, running back down the driveway and pounding it into the street, splitting off into different directions as we're all just intent on getting out of there. But you know that saying, you don't have to be fast enough to outrun the bear, 
you just gotta be faster than your slowest friend. Yeah, that. Because as we're all running, I hear the scream from behind me, then the guy shooting. I turn to see one of my buddies on the floor, getting the snot kicked out of him by this guy, his bag of candy having spilled open with all the contents just glittering in the street lights. I run back and start begging the guy to stop, and he points the gun right at me, at which point I literally pee my pants. I'm not scared to admit it. I was a kid, and it's scary enough having a gun pointed in your face as an adult, let alone when you're like 13. Only when he takes the gun away from me and points it to my buddy's head that I find the will to start screaming. No, please don't. We're sorry. We're really sorry. Please don't shoot him. The guy doesn't respond, or even look at me that time. He just whips off my friend's mask and keeps the gun pressed against his temple and growling stuff about how he's going to blow his brains out right then and there. Who do you think you are, creeping up on my family like that? I should waste you right here and now. And all this other stuff that has my young friend basically bawling his eyes out. It was horrifying. Actually horrifying. Scarier than any horror movie I'd ever seen. Scarier than any super realistic costume or Halloween decoration that any sick horror freak could have possibly dreamed up. I mean, I really did think the guy was about to straight up kill my friend in front of me, and it didn't take long until I was crying too. Then the guy does something to the pistol, cocks it back, puts the barrel to my friend's face again. I'm screaming, don't kill him, don't kill him, over and over. Then he pulls the trigger. But there's no bang, there's just a click. But even the click was enough to send my friend into absolute spasms of terror and wailing. I didn't know anything about guns at the time, and I really did think he'd done whatever you do to prep the thing to fire, and I think I was just too terrified to see or realize that what the guy had done, what he must have done thinking about in retrospect, is eject the clip, clear the chamber, then dry fire the pistol into my friend's face making it look like he was about to shoot him, but actually not doing so at all. Then once we were good and broken, once we were too scared to do anything but stand or lie there, bawling our little eyes out, the dude says something about us learning our lesson, then walks off back up the street towards his house. I remember my friends sort of lying there in the street for a few minutes, just sniffing and crying while I sat down next to him. I say sat down, it was more like my wobbly knees just couldn't handle it anymore and I collapsed down on my bottom near him. We didn't say a thing for the longest time. We just tried to process what just happened. How a dumb Halloween prank could possibly have escalated into something so truly terrifying. Looking back on it, I know we were little jerks tempting faith like that, going back year after year and we probably weren't the only group of kids who were angering this guy, or deliberately targeting them for not being in the Halloween spirit. But I don't think we deserve that. No one does. I mean, this grown man subjected a tween kid to a mock execution in the middle of the street. After a while, we got up and I walked my buddy back to his house, where we told his parents everything that had happened. Needless to say, the cops got involved and the whole thing got way, way messy for a while. The guy ended up catching charges, and we got visits from the cops too to warn us about playing Halloween pranks like that. I'm not a lawyer, and this is like 30 years ago now, so don't quote me on any of this. I mean, I'd actually be happy to hear from anyone who could paint a more detailed picture of the laws that were broken that night, but technically, we were trespassing on their property and breaking a bunch of other harassment laws or something, and if that guy hadn't actually ran after us into the street... I think he might have actually gotten away with the whole thing. But since he did follow us and did the whole mock execution thing, he managed to pick up charges, and for a while it looked like he was facing a brief stint in prison. But the family wasn't exactly in the weeds financially, so from what I remember, they lawyered up and managed to get away with a suspended sentence. Although I do know the guy was banned from owning firearms in our home state, which I suppose was a win for us in some respects. But the lasting effects of that night stayed with me for a long, long time. 
I've had a severe fear of firearms ever since. Like I can watch movies with guns in, no problem. Something about it just being on a screen kind of separates the reality of it for me for some reason. But in person, I literally get a sweat on if I see a gun, which actually posed a serious problem for me during things like your run-of-the-mill traffic stop, where I see a cop's gun and get all nervous. Like, I've had a canine unit called on me more than once because a cop assumes I get all nervous because I have something in my car that I shouldn't have. But I'm sure you guys can't blame me, right? That night was one of the most traumatic of my entire life. Perhaps the most traumatic. And I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that it was the last time I went trick-or-treating. Like, sure, my parents banned me from ever going again, but even if they didn't, I never wanted to be out on Halloween night. Ever. Again. Back in 2012, I sat down with my girlfriend, and after 18 months of dating, I told her my family's deepest, darkest secret. Three weeks later, I came home from work to find all of her stuff gone and a breakup letter sitting on the kitchen table. I learned not to talk to anyone but my sister about it, but I also feel like if I don't get the stuff off my chest from time to time, it'll just eat me alive from the inside out. I've survived this long by talking to therapists, but at this point, I view therapy like atheists view confessional booths. They're a nice novelty, but they're inconsequential. The internet, on the other hand, is an altogether different beast. Not only can I remain anonymous, but you can too. And just like it allows me to say things I'd never tell a person face to face, it allows you to give me your full and unfettered opinions, as brutal as they may be. But I'm okay with that, and that's why I'm writing this, because I don't want absolution. I want judgment. I was 12 years old at the time of my discovery, and all summer, I had this one all-consuming obsession. Pokemon Red. I put hours and hours into catching and training all original 150 Pokemon. Then, when I beat the Elite Four and completed my Pokedex, I just deleted my save and started all over again. But in showing that I loved playing Pokemon so much, I gave my parents a way of punishing me whenever I misbehaved. They were great parents to me for the most part, and my frequent misdeeds were mostly harmless. But whenever I failed to do my chores or was rude to my sister, their go-to confiscation item was my Game Boy. It'd go like this. They'd hide my Game Boy somewhere, but I'd always find it. Then I'd get caught playing it and have it taken away again. This meant that I spent a lot of time snooping around their bedroom in my dad's office, and since it was still summer vacation, I had plenty of time to do it. But it was during my little searching sessions that I discovered that my dad had a secret space, hidden away in his office. He normally kept it locked, but then during one afternoon snooping, I found the key. In his office, my dad had this big old antique cabinet that he kept all kinds of junk in, and I knew he sometimes hid my Game Boy in it. So after having no luck elsewhere, I began to search it. I remember sticking my hand into one of the bottom cabinets, leaning in just a little too hard. Then, I heard a dull crunch of wood as the rear wall of the cabinet suddenly gave way. Then when I looked, hoping I hadn't broken it, I saw that there was a small hidden compartment. Due to the dim light, the only thing I recognized at first was the gun, but there was also something that looked like a letter and, more importantly, something shaped like my Game Boy. I reached out to grab it, but as soon as I touch it, I realize it's not my Game Boy. It felt leathery, not the plastic I was used to, and as curiosity got the better of me, I pulled it out of the hidey hole to see what it was. It was a journal, this old-looking leather-bound journal, and when I opened it up, I recognized my dad's handwriting. I might have recognized his handwriting, but I definitely didn't understand most of what was written. The entries were clearly dated, but what followed was an unintelligible mess of abbreviations, words, and phrases. There was also these little hand-drawn diagrams of what looked like beds, along with stick men that 
had their limbs contorted into unnatural positions. I didn't 100% understand what I was looking at, but I just knew from the fact that it was hidden that it was some part of some secret side that Dad didn't show us. I was so filled with grim curiosity that I felt compelled to check the other stuff out too. First came the gun. It was much heavier than they looked in the movies, and it was much scarier too. I held it like it was made of glass, not even daring to touch the trigger. I then put it back as slowly and carefully as I could. I saved the thing that looked like an envelope until last. I figured that it would be sealed, but after retrieving it, I saw that it wasn't an envelope at all. It was one of those plastic wallets that one-hour photograph developers give you, the kind that house all your photos and negatives tucked inside. I figured that it might be pictures of my family, since those are the only kind I've ever seen come out of a wallet like that. But the only member of my family present in the pictures was my dad, and this version of him was unlike any I'd ever known. The first few pictures were of a bed somewhere I didn't recognize. It didn't look all that remarkable at first, but then I noticed the rope tied around the bedposts, and that bad feeling I had started to intensify. The next few pictures were of a bunch of tools, all laid out on a wooden table, but I noticed a few other things mixed in with them. There was a hammer, a hand drill, a pair of metal pliers, all home improvement stuff, but there was also a scalpel and other surgical looking tools that looked so sharp it made me wince. The next photographs I saw were of my dad, but like I said earlier, there was something really off about him. He'd taken some pictures of himself, but he seemed to be particularly interested in the way his eyes looked, as some were close-up shots of them. I don't know why he didn't just take a look at them in the mirror, but then again, I had no idea why Dad was doing any of this stuff, let alone why he wanted to hide it from us. But when I saw the next picture, I got this intense feeling of dread, and I knew that I was looking at something he'd never want me or Mom to ever see. I figured the first person in the selfie was my dad, but the face was covered by a kind of cloth sack made of black wire mesh, so I couldn't be 100% certain. Assuming that he could see out of it, there was no good reason why my dad would want to cover his face up like that. There was also no good reason why he'd want to use it as a blindfold, and the thought of him doing something like that filled me with dread. But then, when it came to the next few pictures... That feeling was replaced by one of confusion. The picture showed a young Asian man, smiling as he posed next to an art installation somewhere downtown. The next picture was of my dad smiling next to the same art piece. I didn't recognize the guy, but I did think it was odd that he looked way younger than my dad. The happy vibe continued for a few other photos. There were pictures of them drinking together at some bar, pictures of the Asian guy looking like he was dancing. He was all smiles in all of the pictures, and suddenly, the vibe of the photos changed dramatically. In the next picture I saw, he was standing awkwardly with his arms by his sides with a look of slight fear on his face. The next few showed him tied to the bed. He was looking up at the camera and the terror on his face was even more pronounced. The final picture showed a man in that cloth mask leaning over the guy. I couldn't see what they were doing, but the guy's legs were all tensed up and pulling on the ropes that bound them, almost like he was in an intense amount of pain. I remember having an incredible visceral reaction to that last picture. So after shoving the photos back into the wallet, I tried to put everything back into the little hidey hole exactly as I'd found it. After that, I abandoned the search for my Game Boy locked up my dad's office, then spent the rest of the afternoon in my bedroom, swinging back and forth between thinking about what I'd seen and trying to forget about it altogether. When my dad got home from work, he just figured that I was so angry at him for confiscating my Game Boy. Only my mom realized that there was something deeper going on, but I couldn't bring myself to tell her what I'd seen. If I did, it would be the end of my family as I knew it. So, I just kept my mouth shut. It wasn't that I didn't want to talk to someone about the pictures. I just didn't know how to do it without some kind of familial apocalypse. Besides, 
I wasn't even 100% sure what I'd actually been looking at. I tried to pretend that I hadn't seen anything, but my relationship with my dad was never the same afterwards. All I could do when I saw his face was picturing him in those photos, wondering what the hell he was doing to that poor, unsuspecting guy. I assumed mom knew nothing about what my dad had been doing in those photographs, and I felt incredibly sorry for her. But at the same time, I was burdened with the horrific guilt of being the only one who could warn her, but not being capable of it. But then the day came when he walked into my bedroom and asked me the one question I've been dreading for almost a year. When he asked if I'd been in his office recently, the words sent a chill through me. Thankfully, I'd learned to hide my emotions very well, so without looking up from playing Sega, I just flatly told him no. After that, I hoped to God that he wouldn't question me further, and I prayed to hear the sound of the door closing behind him. But the seconds went by and the door didn't close. He just stood there, staring at the back of my head, saying nothing, doing nothing. When he asked me if I was sure, I just kept my eyes locked on the screen, then gave him the most nonchalant denial I could muster. Those were some of the scariest few moments of my whole life, and even when the door finally closed, I was terrified that he'd be standing there, waiting to have a private talk with me. He wasn't, which was obviously a huge relief, but as I got back to my game, I started to wonder if he'd actually taken me at my word. Then, like a bullet between the eyes, it hit me. Some minor detail from almost two years ago came rushing back into focus. After the dread got too much for me, I'd just shove the photos back into the wallet. What I hadn't done was rearrange them back into their original order. Someone who really knew those photographs, someone who'd pored over them time and time again, who knew exactly which order they were in. This was obviously a huge problem for me, but as I continued to think on it, I realized something. He couldn't actually accuse me of looking at the pictures. He couldn't just outright accuse anyone because if they weren't the guilty party, they'd know that he'd been hiding something. The little detail was the only thing that saved me from God knows what for years. And with time, the whole thing kind of faded into the background. It was always still there, but the idea of my mom finding out about the pictures, of seeing all the heartbreak and the shame in her, I just couldn't let that happen. Don't get me wrong. I was in almost constant terror of my dad hurting us, but with each day that passed, it grew easier to reassure myself that he wouldn't. The next time the photos seriously weighed on my mind, I was in my second year of college. I was on the opposite side of the country, studying at USC, as far as my grades could take me, though. But moving away came with a fresh helping of guilt. I felt like I abandoned my mom and sister to whoever my dad truly was, or at least used to be. I just couldn't do it anymore. I'd spend six years swinging back and forth between anxiety and depression, and it's been years since he'd found out someone had found his little hidey hole, as I call it. If he was going to murder us all in our sleep, I figured that he'd already done it. But then, without all that stress in my life, my mind started to compulsively focus on finer details. I ended up spending hours at a time pouring through news articles that detailed missing persons or dead bodies that had been found from all over the Northwest. I didn't know what my dad had actually been doing to that guy. And sometimes, I wished that I'd looked at the rest of the photos so I actually knew for certain. But I knew the guy's face, and I knew I'd be able to recognize him if his pictures were included in some missing persons or murder news piece. On multiple occasions, I considered how utterly futile it was, spending hours at a time reading through random articles that listed the victim as having an Asian-sounding second name. It must have been hundreds from the past decade or so, and when I realized that I didn't actually know when the incident in the photo had taken place, I realized that I was trying to find a needle in a haystack. But then one day, on some rainy Thursday afternoon, I found my needle. 
I don't want to tell you the poor guy's name because I don't want any of you reaching out to his family. They've definitely already been through enough. But like I said, I found him. I recognized the guy's face from a web page and it was a smile. I swear I'd have recognized it anywhere, burned into my brain after having stared at those secret photos. The article gave a few details regarding his last known whereabouts but mentioned that the guy had talked about visiting a friend in the weeks before his disappearance. They went on to plead for any information, basically saying that the police had no idea what had happened to the poor guy. But I knew. I'd known for years. I just didn't quite realize it. Incidentally, the answer to my fixation brought up a whole new question. Just what was I going to do with this information? The answer was simple. Nothing. There was nothing I could do that wouldn't have a devastating effect on my mom and sister. My sister was still pretty young back then, definitely not the age to process the fact that her father was, at the very minimum, involved in the disappearance of another human being. There was nothing I could do right then, nothing I was okay with, but now that I had my answer, I could at least plan to do something in the future. I didn't quite know when that might be and I wasn't quite sure how I'd go about it, but I knew I was going to confront him about it, at least before he died. Yet as it turned out, it wasn't my dad's impending death that prompted me to put my plan into action. It was my mom's. Two years after I graduated college, I was living and working in Charlotte, North Carolina when I got a phone call from my little sister. Mom had cancer, terminal cancer, and it was aggressive. She had a few months tops, and that's what the doctor said anyway, and I planned on spending as much time as possible with her during that time. When she finally passed, and the truth of what my dad had done could no longer hurt her, I made my move and did something I should have done more than 10 years prior. I called my dad. For the first time in what felt like forever, and I gave him an ultimatum. I told him that I knew what he'd done, that it was me that had found the pictures all those years ago. I told him the only thing that stopped me from saying anything was not wanting to destroy our family, and that I wanted mom to live a life of blissful ignorance before I finally tore apart his legacy. I gave him two choices. He could turn himself into the police and do the right thing, or I'd tell them everything I'd seen and how I could link it to the missing persons case from the late 90s that I'd found. And the next day, I got another call from my sister, marking the second time she'd been the bearer of bad news in less than six months. My dad had taken his own life. It came as a shock. I considered the possibility that I might take his own life before I'd put my plan into action, but decided that he just wasn't the type. I figured he'd go on the run, try to move up to Alaska and change his name or something, maybe even leave the country. I guess it showed how little I really knew him, even up until the day he died. The only thing was, the whole thing didn't die with my dad. There was still more work to be done. I went back home to check his office for the pictures, intent on handing them into the police, but they were gone. I turned the house upside down, even checked the trash for ashes or things of that nature, but I found nothing. He must have destroyed them or disposed of them somewhere, but that wasn't good enough. He must have known that sooner or later the cops would get him for whatever he'd been a part of, so he just decided to end it all and rob his victim's family of the justice they deserve. I went to the cops anyway, told them everything I knew, and eventually received a call back from two homicide detectives. They called a handful of times over the course of the next few weeks, a few questions here, a few questions there, but then through answering them, I realized how difficult a task they were faced with after DNA swabs of his office yielded no matches for their victim. There was very little they could really prove, and even if I did manage to turn over the photographs, the only person they showed committing a crime is a man in a mask. All they could do was speculate. Yet, I know it was my dad under there. In my mind, there's no reason why he'd take his own life. 
He'd cultivated such a wholesome facade over the years, having successfully concealed a past blackened by sadism and death, that no one thought him capable of such things, and he was far too proud to watch it all crumble in front of him. But even now, it's still not over. My dad's since been considered as a suspect in the disappearances of multiple young men throughout the 90s and early 2000s. I've still yet to hear anything from the police or FBI regarding it, but it's still something that's being actively considered. So now, all these years later, I'm faced with the possibility that my father was an actual serial killer, and that my silence following the discovery of the photographs enabled him to continue killing. I could be responsible for an untold number of unsolved murders all over the Northwest, and when I tell people that, it's not enough to hear platitudes anymore. So judge me. Pour your scorn upon me, I promise you I can take it. Because as far as I'm concerned, I deserve far, far worse. If you really like my content and want to support me, please like this video and click the subscribe button. It helps me to grow my channel as essential in reaching a wider audience. Most of you watching my videos aren't subscribed to my channel, and that's why my animations can't reach their full potential. They aren't recommended to more people who would surely love my content as much as you do. You can always unsubscribe at any moment. Thank you in advance, and enjoy the rest of the video. I was 12 and my older sister and I were home alone for the weekend. I was waiting for a friend to pick me up and getting restless. There was a knock on the door. Thinking it was her, I ran to answer it without checking through the people. A man was standing there with a clipboard and he said he needed to check our gas meter. I was entrenched in the disappointment of my friend still not having arrived yet. So I just told him, yeah sure, whatever you need to do. I didn't notice at the time, but he wasn't dressed as a city official. He had a green and purple shirt with bold stripes, kind of like the host of Blue's Clues. He came in and immediately went upstairs to where our bedrooms were and walked into the open door of my room, the typically girly girl room with pink and glitter. Thank God my sister came down the stairs at the exact same moment and said, Oh, is that Daphne's dad? Why is he going upstairs? And I complained about how Daphne wasn't here yet, and was going on and on about how unreliable she was, and then my sister cut me off. Wait, wait. If Daphne isn't here, then who is that? I said, uh, he said he was here to read the gas meters. Her face turned white. She flung open the front door and dragged me out, hand clamped over my mouth protesting. She said, our gas meters are outside. Neither of us had a cell phone, and obviously, we weren't going back in the house to call authorities on the landline. Then my ever so resourceful sister had a stroke of genius. A man was walking right by our house and she motioned him over. She called out loudly into the house. Oh dad, it's good you're home. A man from the city is here to read the gas meters, he's upstairs. And just like she'd hoped, this man on the street said, what are you talking about? The man in the striped shirt bolted out of that house. The man on the street asked us repeatedly if we were okay, if we needed him to stay and wait in the yard with us until our parents got home. He was very sweet. We were so startled that we barely thanked him before slamming and locking the doors along with the windows. As irate as my sister was that I let someone in the house, she begged me not to call the authorities because my parents left her in charge and she worried she'd be in trouble. I didn't want to catch any heat from carelessly allowing some random guy inside, so I was on the same page. Three weeks later, a girl in our community went missing, with the same M.O. She was home alone, and the authorities found the door open and no signs of forced entry. My sister and I discussed our options, but deep down we knew we had no choice but to come clean. We told the police everything. I don't know if it ever helped but they did tell us they had reason to believe it was the same man. They also tracked down the man who helped us on the street. It turns out we already knew him. He worked in the butcher shop. We just didn't recognize him. He was lifelong friends with our family after that. Our parents were definitely mortified. They weren't angry with us, just glad we were okay. 
though they did review all the rules of caution and didn't let us leave home alone for a while. They ended up finding that girl. Apparently, she'd been held for a few days, then burned alive. They never caught that man, but fear not. He appeared to be in his early 30s, in the 1960s, so any case, he has to be dead by now. I just thank God every day for my sister's resourcefulness and quick action. This happened well over 10 years ago, so I'll try my best to describe the events accurately. One of my childhood homes had a balcony that was attached to both my mother's bedroom and mine via a big double glass door on each of our rooms. Next to the balcony are two trees, one I often used to climb up and down from the balcony itself. This balcony faced out to the street. One night when I was about 13, my brother and mother weren't home, so I was in bed reading with a very dim reading light. I heard what sounded like something moving in one of our trees outside, but this doesn't worry me because possums and bats are common in our area. Now I had thin curtains on the glass doors that separated my room and the balcony. As mentioned previously, the doors faced out towards the street, where the street lamp light was always visible through those curtains. Shortly after hearing the tree rustling noises, I see a shadow slowly move past the doors, at which point I immediately turn off my reading light and freeze like a deer in headlights. Shadow is tall, so it wasn't one of the neighbor kids that I'm friends with. And it definitely wasn't all of my five-foot mother. The person moved slowly, creeping as though they were trying to not be noticed. They wouldn't likely be able to see into my room, but I could see them thanks to the streetlights behind them, creating a dark silhouette. They moved past my doors, out of sight. I sat there unable to move or even think about what to do other than be absolutely still. That is until I heard another sound. The sound of someone trying to open the glass door on my mom's side. I didn't know if she had locked them, but I wasn't taking any chances. I moved as quickly and as silently as I could to my bedroom door and locked it. I listened for what the person was doing now. They were still jiggling the glass door handle, but it sounded like the doors weren't opening. I felt relief. This person couldn't get in, surely, and all I had to do was wait for them to realize that and then they would leave, right? Well, I heard light footsteps move back along the balcony to my set of doors until I saw that shadow stop directly in front of them. Again, I froze. He couldn't see me. He couldn't know that I could see him. I saw a shadow of a hand reach up to my door handle and my heart stopped. Had I actually locked those doors myself today? I was out there earlier, what if I forgot? The seconds leading up to him grabbing the handle felt like an eternity, but thankfully, when this person tried to open the door, it did not open. It was locked. I sighed, such a sigh of relief that I was worried he had heard it. After this, he began pacing the length of the balcony. I didn't have a mobile phone as my mom thought it was too young for it and couldn't have one yet, and the landline was at the other end of the house but I was far too scared to take my eyes off this person or even to call for help. I was silently crying, tears falling down my cheeks as I internally prayed that they would just leave. And I heard him stop moving and he said, I could just break the glass, you know. Before I could even process this, I saw car headlights turn the corner of my street and then stop at our property gate. My mom was home. The person on the balcony moved out of sight and I heard a loud thump as they jumped off of it. When my mom came inside, I was hysterical and was barely coherent in telling her what had happened. Eventually, I got the message across, and she called the police. They never found or caught anyone, but a neighbor reported a truck in the street that matched the description of a truck that had been reported recently for attempted child abductions near my school, only a block away. Since I walked that short distance daily, the police suspected that he had followed me or seen where I live and then waited for me to be home alone. So to that creepy dude who scared the hell out of a 13 year old girl, yeah, let's not meet again. I'm a 27 year old male and live alone in a small one bedroom house in our rural area of Idaho. 
I was never the type to enjoy cities, nor was I the type to be around a lot of people. I just wanted a nice and quiet life, which is why I chose Idaho. Just this past week, I experienced something while home alone that I just had to write about. It was around 8pm and I was at home cleaning the house when I hear my washing machine ring letting me know that my clothes were done. My washer and dryer are both located in the basement of my home, so I went down there while turning on the light when I noticed something odd. One of the shelves that had been up was now face down with tons of my tools scattered around the floor. This was strange as it was pretty sturdy. Why I didn't hear it fall over, I don't know, but I stand it back up and tend to my laundry. I take out my clothes and put them into the dryer and the second I do the shelf from behind me falls over and creates a loud crash. I instantly turn around to face the direction of where the shelf had fallen and there, standing next to it, was a tall lanky man with a disturbing grin. He wore a white shirt, baggy pants and just simply looked dead inside as if he were extremely tired. I wasn't sure what it was, but something about this man really creeped me out and not to mention that he kinda looked like L from Death Note. The minute I laid eyes on him, I let out a WHO THE HELL ARE YOU? in a short, scared, angry tone. He gave no response and just kind of stood there looking at me, staring into my soul. Figuring he might have been in the possession of drugs, I calmly asked him if he needed help or was lost. Even with my calm approach, he still didn't talk or even move. Not knowing what to do, I call police and tell them my situation. They said they'd send someone over, but that it could take a while due to extreme weather conditions. After I had hung up, the man had still been staring at me with his baggy eyes doing seemingly nothing. Then, after what felt like an eternity, he simply turned around and walked back up the stairs and out the back door. I of course followed him and he kept walking away from my house, disappearing into the night. There aren't any houses or other forms of civilization for a few miles, so I was confused as to who he was or how he got here. He hasn't been back since, and although it was a pretty creepy experience, I'm glad he's now gone. This whole story started when I was back in my early years in college. Before I can tell you the creepy part of this story, I have to tell you the pre-story. The background, if you will. We once had a neighbor that worked for a private agency that did a lot of work for the government. As far as the rumor mill says, he basically ordered himself a bride on the internet from Haiti. He brought this person over, married her, and even paid for her to go to school. But what happened is one day we saw him getting hauled away by the police. Now, this isn't the creepy part. This is just the start. After the guy was taken away, it eventually got out that he was apparently arrested and sent to federal prison for child pornography, which was strange, as the only place they found the evidence was his home computer, which was hooked up to the same network as his computer at work. Now, this is why this is odd. It's because both computers were on a government network. He sure as heck would have got caught right away, right? And the other point is that he was never home during the time the computer was downloading the evidence. I mean, yeah, you can do damn near anything with a computer, but the only person home at those times was his wife. Anyways, he got arrested and he was taken to a federal prison like I said. Well, then shortly after, the wife moves in her boyfriend from Haiti. And let me tell you, this man was strange. He would always sit in the garage bug naked with the garage door wide open. I really never felt comfortable with them next door. But the creepy part is that one night when I was just chilling in my bed, cuddled under the covers watching anime, I had then heard some yelling outside 
and the neighbor's floodlights going off. So I got out of my comfy space and I went to look out my window. I looked through the blinds and I saw the two standing on the side of the house screaming at each other. I just ignored them and I went back to my comfortable spot and just continued watching TV. Well, they did this several more times over the next few hours. I, of course, being as nosy as I am, got up several times and looked, but it was really nothing more than a screaming match. So, about an hour after the last screaming match they had, there was a frantic knocking on our front door. This was about 2 a.m. in the morning at this time. So I turned off my TV and slipped silently out of the bed. The lady was pounding so hard on my door that it woke up my father, who actually slept on the other side of the house. In the dark, I can then hear a gun cock, and my dad then whisper, Stay there. He crept to the door and then looked out of the peephole. And that's when we then heard her banging on the neighbor's door on my dad's side of the house. The neighbor was now at 2 a.m. running to everyone's house in the street, just screaming, Help, he's going to kill me! And she was covered in blood. I believe every person on the street that night called the cops. The cops were there in about 15 minutes, taking everyone's statements. When they finally got to our house to take ours, and they found out that my room was on the side of the house next to theirs, they wanted to know if I saw or heard anything. I told them everything that I saw and heard. I told them how the two were arguing right outside the house several times, setting off the floodlights. Then the cop asked if I had saw a red car. I told him no, there was no red car. He kept trying to lead me into saying there was one. I kept telling him I was awake the entire time, and if anyone drove into the driveway, I would have not only heard it, but I would have saw it, as it would have definitely set off the motion lights. I even added how those damn motion lights always wake me up every time they go off when I'm actually asleep. So no, there was no red car just the two of them. The next morning, we woke up to a blood-saturated couch sitting outside on her curb. I have no idea what the hell actually happened, and I don't think I want to. When I was in grad school, I relocated from my home state to a new state five hours away to attend classes. The area around the university I was going to wasn't the safest, but I figured finding a nearby apartment was the easiest way to save on costs, so that I didn't incur a ton of debt pursuing my degree. The building I moved into was basically a converted three-story house with a large two-story extension behind it. I lived in one of the middle units on the first floor, and I had a parking space in the very back of the building. I mostly kept to myself, but I inevitably ended up meeting my next door neighbors. They were a married couple with no kids, probably 10 or 12 years older than me. I found out through the building super that the husband was the son of the man who owned the entire property. The husband had been in a really bad automobile accident that left him with some lasting cognitive limitations. The wife seemed nice, but had a very dominating personality and talked a lot. They were both really enthusiastic to meet me and get to know me, which I initially chalked up to them being lonely. I would later start to suspect then they wanted some kind of relationship with me. It was that kind of weird vibe. They would frequently either sit outside their door or leave just their screen door close so that they could see me and stop me while I walked to and from my car to my own apartment. These conversations would take anywhere from five minutes to half an hour before they get the hint that I was trying to go about my day. They would always end with an offer to have me over for dinner and a drink sometime, which I would always politely decline. Their friendly veneer towards me was even more unsettling, considering I would hear them getting into shouting matches most nights, sometimes all night long while I tried to sleep. For a whole year I dealt with this, right before my lease was up in January and I found a new place to live. I got really good at avoiding them, but when I was moving out, the husband finally caught me with boxes in my hand. He called after me. Hey, where are you going? I turned around to face him, but kept walking backwards, and then said, Oh, hi. 
I'm actually moving out this week. His eyes got wide, and he just stared at me, then saying, But you never came over for dinner. I didn't really know what to say to that, apart from, Yeah, I'm sorry we didn't get the chance. He stood in the middle of the driveway and just continued to stare at me without saying anything. So I turned back around and loaded the box into my car. As I left the complex with that load of stuff, I drove past him and he just continued to stare at me with wide eyes and an expressionless face. About two days later, I had moved all of my extra things out and was just living in the unit with my essentials. That night, it was brutally cold with temperatures dropping down in the negatives. When the sun went down, all the electric in my unit went off. I didn't have access to my electrical panel, and when I called the super, he didn't answer. I ended up having to call the electric company to report an outage and gathered up my stuff to stay in my then-girlfriend's parents' house. I went back the next morning, determined to move the last of my stuff once and for all. When I saw the electric company's truck, pulled over in the street in front of the building. I was entering my unit when the workman came up to me and asked if I was the one who reported the outage. I said I was, and he gave a little chuckle, then saying, Well, buddy, you managed to piss somebody off. I asked him what he meant by that, and he said, The only outage in the building was to your unit. Normally when a circuit is tripped, the switch flips to a halfway position to turn off. Your switch was flipped all the way off, so someone went down there and did that to you on purpose. I asked him where the switch was, and he said the basement storage unit, but that's only accessible by the super or the building owner. I pieced it all together and realized that my neighbor had turned off my power on the coldest night of the year. I didn't even bother confronting him about it. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. I finished packing up my stuff and left, never looking back to see if he or his wife were watching me go. It was the summer of 2016, and I had just gotten married, and we moved and settled into a townhouse in a nice neighborhood. Life was going good. A few months had passed, and I found out that I was pregnant. My husband and I were extremely happy along with the rest of our family. Now, this is an important part of the story. My mom and dad lived in a townhouse just right up from ours, and my grandparents lived in one between mine and my parents. We all loved the location, and the townhouses were extremely nice, and so we all just moved into one so that we could all be close to one another. We're a tight-knit family. My husband liked to go fishing at a local fishing tournament that my town held every weekend. The tournament would end really late, and I used to just stay home most of the time, because for one, nauseous and just very sick. For two, I couldn't handle the smell, especially being pregnant. So with nothing else to really do, I would just try and get some fresh air and try to enjoy the evenings with my mom and grandparents. That's when it all started. I began to notice my neighbor acting very strange. He lived in the last townhouse at the very end of the townhouse complex. However, we didn't have a mailbox slot or anything in our doors, so we had to check our mail at the entrance of the townhouse complex. He would drive into the complex and position his car to where he had a clear view of me and my family as we would be sitting outside of the evenings. He would then proceed to check his mail, and then after he checked his mail, he would just sit there. He would sit there for sometimes 30 minutes to an hour, just staring at us as we sat out on my Nana's porch. I knew he was staring at us because I could barely see his face, and his eyes locked into mine. His expression was so empty. He really creeped me out. He would do this every single evening. My family would get freaked out as well, and we always just told each other to just watch our backs. One night, I decided I was going to go over to the fishing pond with my husband and my dad for the evening. Well, needles to say, that didn't last too long. I got sick and had to head back home. 
I told my husband that if I started feeling better, I would come back. He agreed, and he told me to go home and get some rest. So I then went home, and I had watched a movie or two, and by then it was time to go pick up my husband, because I had dropped him off earlier that evening. I grabbed my keys, and I head across town. I picked him up, and we were on the way home. We were approaching a red light, when I had then seen a car approaching the back of my truck very quickly. I then told my husband to look back at this maniac, as the car got as close as it possibly could without hitting the bumper of our truck. He was straight up on my ass. The light turned green. I quickly drove off, and I noticed the car just sitting there. I told my husband to look, and right as I said that, the car started moving, and the headlights shut off. Now, keep in mind, it was like 2 a.m. at this point. I said, Oh my God, look! I know, just try and stay focused on the road, my husband said. I looked back in my rearview mirror, and he had turned his lights on, and he was now driving extremely fast to catch up with me, and he had his high beams on. As he was now quickly approaching, he turned off his headlights yet again. My husband could sense how scared I was. Hell, I think he was a little freaked out too. I finally get to the townhouse complex and I pull in. And the car behind me then turns on his lights and follows me in. The car then stops as I then keep driving to pull into my parking spot. I park our truck and then look at my husband. To which we both agree to not get out of the truck. We look back at the entrance and the car begins to move, and then slowly creeps down the road. We then get a good look at the make and model of the car. That's when I then realized that it was our creepy ass neighbor. The neighbor then proceeded to park his car, and he then gets out and stands on his porch, staring at our truck. I swear, he actually did this for like a solid two to three minutes. If you really like my content and want to support me, please like this video and click the subscribe button. It helps me to grow my channel as essential in reaching a wider audience. Most of you watching my videos aren't subscribed to my channel and that's why my animations can't reach their full potential. They aren't recommended to more people who would surely love my content as much as you do. You can always unsubscribe at any moment. Thank you in advance and enjoy the rest of the video. He knows we had not gotten out yet. He then proceeded to open his door and go into his home. My husband and I just look at each other in disbelief. I told my husband, Who in their right mind does that? He just shook his head and sighed. Then we went inside. We just couldn't believe what had just happened. We both agreed that he's extremely strange, and to just try to avoid him at all costs. Another time where he creeped me the hell out was when once again I was at a red light, and this time I was alone. Well, I just so happened to look in my rearview mirror, and I see the neighbor in the car directly behind me. He was so close that he almost rear-ended me. As I was looking back, I noticed that he had this really sinister look on his face. The feeling I got when I saw him was so terrifying that I can't even begin to explain it. He had his head bowed down, and he was looking up, and he had both of his hands on the steering wheel, and he just looked so mean like really deranged. The light turned green and I began to drive and he was still on my ass. So I picked up the speed a little more and yet again, so did he. I'm now starting to panic at this point, thinking, what if he wrecks into me? I'm six months pregnant. He could cause me to lose my baby. He's still tailgating me at this point and he still had that same sinister look on his face. It honestly looked like he wanted to hurt me. I hurried up and I turned on my left blinker, then pulled over to the right as a way to distract him so I could get away without giving him the opportunity to follow me. I pulled off the road really quick and he almost caused me to wreck because of how close he was to the rear end of the truck. I called my husband and I told him what happened. My nerves at that point were shot. I gathered myself and went home and as I approached the complex, there he was. He was at the mailbox checking his mail. 
I pulled in and parked and then called my mom, asking her to walk down, and I then told her everything that just happened. She quickly came and approached my passenger door. As she approached, she said that he began to drive slowly down the road, and that when he passed by the truck, he was just staring. So I hurried up and got out and then went into my house, making sure everything was secure. My mom couldn't believe how he acted. My sister found out about the situation and began to dig deep. She's the private investigator of the family. Well, we soon found out that he was a convicted murderer who had done the unspeakable. This guy had murdered his lover and slept beside the dead corpse for days. He was planning on getting rid of the body, but luckily, he got caught in the act. He tried claiming insanity, but he ended up getting denied. He served time and was released a few short years too soon. I began to become very paranoid after I had found out what he had done. I always made sure to lock every door, every window. Everything I could do to feel safe, I did it. I also carried a gun with me everywhere I went. Legally, of course. I was scared of him. Hell, I had every reason to be scared of him. A couple of months had passed and my dad and husband was out working on the truck while my mom and I and my newborn baby was sitting on the porch trying to enjoy the evening. We both noticed his car pull into the complex and he was blasting the song, I've had the time of our life. You know, the iconic song in the movie Dirty Dancing. He's slowly creeping down the road and as always, just staring at me and my mother and he drives down to his parking spot, beginning to pull into a spot and then puts his car in reverse, and then backing up to where he has a clear view of me and my mom, and has turned plumb around in his car staring at us, all while that song is still blaring. My mom and I tell my husband and dad to get up. At that point, they've had enough. They said they were going to go ask him what the hell he's staring at. Well, he sees them walking towards his vehicle, and he then speeds off down the alleyway. I don't think I'll ever be able to listen to that song ever again without thinking of that creep. Thanks for ruining that for me. I really appreciate it. He eventually moved out a short time after that, and I couldn't have been happier. I was finally able to feel at peace in my own home again. I sometimes see him out and about in town, and when I do, I'm instantly reminded of just how fearful he once made me feel. He really is one hell of a creep. For some context, I'm a 25 year old female and this happened to me when I was a child. Around 12 years old to be exact. During this time, I was an only child and always have been ever since my dad had left me at the age of 10 and I had been living with my mom ever since. Because my mom and dad had basically gotten a divorce, her and I moved to another state. We had bought our new home and were excited to start our new lives. The house we had moved into wasn't anything too special. It was just your average house appropriate for two or three people. And seeing as it was only my mom and I, it was perfect for us. Anyway, my mom had found a job pretty quickly and she'd been the one working late hours into the day, which meant that I had to walk home from school. Why I don't take the bus is another story, but I genuinely enjoyed walking for a 12 year old. One day, I was doing my usual routine of walking home from school when I was walking in front of the house next to mine. For whatever reason, I looked toward the front yard of the house and noticed a dog inside its kennel taking a nap. Excitement filled my body as I adored dogs. However, with my mom being allergic to them, she wouldn't allow us to have one. The gate to the house was surprisingly open and me being the snoopy 12 year old I was made my way to the kennel. I hit my hand on the cage and startled the dog a bit, but it didn't show any signs of aggression. 
but rather friendliness as if it were happy to see me. I let the dog sniff me for a few minutes before the front door opened and a man stepped out and sat in his yard chair. By the looks of it, he looked to be about 30 or so. Realizing I got caught on his property, I got up and started making my way over to my house. However, the man then yelled something along the lines of, Hey, uh, don't be scared. You could pet the dog. I don't mind. He introduced himself as Tyler and asked if I was new to the neighborhood. I told him yes and we started making small talk here and there. Eventually, the time came to go before my mom got home, so I said goodbye to Tyler and his dog but promised I'd return the next day. My visits to go see the dog continued for about a week. Tyler would always be outside waiting for me and even offered me Capri Suns once in a while. I finally felt proud of myself for finding something that I actually enjoyed doing and shaking the feeling off of my past friends. One day, I was walking by the house as usual when I look over and saw four police officers by the front door, putting Tyler in what looked to be handcuffs along with my dad. I was in immediate shock as to what I was seeing and my dad then came to me as Tyler was forced into the back seat of the police car. For the rest of the week, I would be constantly curious as to why Tyler was arrested. It wasn't until a few years later where the conversation was brought up again and my dad then told me something I didn't know. Apparently, while I was at school, my dad had been called into work when he was driving by the house and saw Tyler beating the dog. Turns out, Tyler had stolen dogs from different owners and brought them back to his place so he could do God knows what to them. He would give them a lack of food and water and mistreat them for his amusement. Thankfully, he was arrested and was never allowed near any animals again for the rest of his life. Thankfully, the dog I had been seeing survived and returned to its owner. I hope I never see that Tyler guy again. You sick creep. This story is told in the perspective of a female. This took place a few years ago when I was in my late 20s in Los Angeles. I had just recently graduated from college and had just bought my first house in the gated community in the suburbs. It was a decent neighborhood with a playground, a pool, and even a racquetball court which is more than you could ask for with it being a suburban neighborhood. One day. My boyfriend had just dropped me off in my house after seeing a movie and I was worn out to say the least. Because I was so tired, I figured laying down on my bed would be a nice distraction from unpacking the rest of the boxes from when I moved in. Needless to say, I had probably laid there for a good 10 minutes when I heard a knock at the door. I got up from bed and answered the door and was greeted to a Latino man I'd never seen before holding a plate of cookies. Oh, um, hi, can I help you? He introduced himself as Louis and he then begins to explain that he was my neighbor and came to welcome me to the neighborhood while presenting the plate of cookies. I tell him that it was very sweet of him to do that and thanked him for the cookies. He welcomed me once again and took off back to his house which happened to be right next to mine. The next night, I had been unpacking some boxes while wearing yoga pants and a tank top as there was no AC. Unfortunately, I didn't look into the air conditioning system while buying the house. Because it was so hot in the room, I opened the windows to let that cool night breeze in when I see Lewis looking at me through his window. He gave me a smile and raised his hand to say hello. 
I awkwardly smiled back and waved at him and immediately closed the windows and blinds. Even though I didn't want to make him seem like I caught him looking at me, I was still a little creeped out but I didn't feel threatened. However, his stalkerish encounters didn't end there. It wasn't until a week later when I realized he seemed to be outside more often, primarily when I was. Whether I'd be taking out the trash, cleaning the yard, driving to work, or even going out just to have a drink, he'd most of the time be there. I told my boyfriend about it, but with him being a not-so-overprotective dude, he didn't take me seriously. He claimed that Lewis was just a harmless weirdo looking for people to talk to. His stalkerish moves went on for about a good month before he finally took a stand and went over to his place. He opened the door and his face lit up with pure joy once he saw me. I told him in the most polite way that he was sweet but to please stop looking at me all the time and that I have a boyfriend. His face of excitement turned into an upset frown within a matter of two seconds and he then shut the door in front of me. Coming from a 30 year old, it was much more disturbing. Fast forward till a couple of weeks later, I came home one day from work to find that my house had been trashed. Furniture turned over, broken glass, holes in the walls, and even my fish tank was broken. I went through the footage from my Google Nest and was utterly horrified to what appeared to be Lewis in my house. I called the cops and pressed charges on Lewis. Turns out, this wasn't the only time he had been in my house while I was gone. He admitted to sneaking into my house several times over the time I was living there, and I went on to get a restraining order. This all started around December. I'm not sure if I should be contacting the police or anything, but it's quite unnerving. So I stay at my girlfriend's house on the weekends and she lives on campus at a university. She lives with two of her roommates and lives next door to her friends. This one night, I woke up to screaming at 2 a.m. Now, typically, you'd expect to be hearing screaming on campus from people leaving bars late at night. However, this was very different. There was a blood-curdling scream from a girl yelling for her dad. She screamed dad at least four times. I don't even know how my girlfriend didn't wake up from this. Then it became quiet and my heart was pounding. At first, my girlfriend thought I was just having a bad dream or something like that. But the scream was all too real. This experience was terrifying. But this wasn't the only time someone heard the screaming. About two months later, her neighbor texted her in a group chat, asking if anyone heard screaming. And then, exactly a week later, another neighbor heard it as well. Almost exactly another week goes by, and her friend, who lives a couple of streets down, had roommates that texted each other, asking about if they heard the screaming at 2 a.m. At this point, it seems pretty clear. It could be some sort of luring for trafficking. Less than a month later, around 11.30 p.m., my girlfriend's roommate thought she heard a girl screaming, get off, and she looked out the window, but didn't see anything. That was the last time someone heard anything. These events seem very planned. And the fact that my girlfriend lives with two other girls alone in a house without a deadlock makes it even worse. I think all kids think their parents are strict. It's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? Like, I used to think my parents were strict because I had to set bedtime and curfews on weekends, but then I stayed over to a friend's house for the first time when I was 13 and... It changed my entire view of my parents. 
because his mom was an actual tyrant. Like, it was scary to watch. We live in a rural area, my friend even more so. Like, again, I thought I lived out in the sticks, but he lived miles from even the smallest towns, like right on the outskirts of Galloway Forest Park. It was a nice wee gaff, but it was old school, proper old school. Like all of the locks were latches instead of key locks, which meant all of the doors were accessible from the inside and outside, including bedrooms and bathrooms. On the evening in question, we had a nice enough time, watching James Bond movies in between rounds of deathmatch on N64's GoldenEye. Admittedly, I was a proper little mummy's boy at the time, and I was pretty uncomfortable at sleeping over at a friend's place, more so because of the distance from home. But like I said, the evening was good up until a point. We were both immersed into the whole Bond lore, stuffing ourselves with pizza and arguing over Brosnan versus Connery. Then, as we're talking... My friend's mum comes into the lounge, calmly walked up to him, then gives him the biggest, loudest, hardest slap in the face I'd ever seen, like it was almost more like an open palm smack than anything else. I'd never seen anything like that, I mean not a parent hitting a child anyway. So, in the seconds that followed I was literally just like, what just happened? My mate burst into tears, crying gets up and runs upstairs with his mum in hot pursuit and the whole time she's screaming stuff like disgusting at him. I was just dumbstruck. There I was, chilling with my mate when his mum just comes up and annihilates his face for apparently no bloody reason whatsoever. Anyway, they both disappear upstairs and I'm left on my own to wonder what's going on. I just stay there, not knowing what else to do waiting for them to reappear when they do, my mate just plonks himself on the sofa, red in the face, eyes all puffy from crying. Then, when his mum is out of earshot, I asked what happened. Turns out that she smacked him square in the face because he was eating with his mouth open. Yep, eating with his mouth open. That's all he did to deserve that open palm punch to the face. After that, I was petrified of this guy's mum. I mean, we didn't have very many sleepovers at his place, and I have a few more stories involving the absence of any privacy because of those old lock situation. Don't get me wrong, I know there's way more harrowing things out there as an adult, but the way she treated him was the most abusive parenting I'd ever seen. This guy's parents were some of the scariest people I'd encountered in my life, let alone my childhood. If he was punished that bad for just eating with his mouth open, what else did the poor kids suffer through for other seemingly minor infractions? It made me feel very, very lucky to have the parents I did. Let me just put it that way. I had a sleepover when I was about eight or nine. Me and my best friend were watching the Scooby-Doo episode with the creepy voodoo dolls. We're having a whale of a time, enjoying all the wholesome spooks, but... When she sees the voodoo dolls, I can see my friend getting visibly nervous. I knew her mom was hardcore Christian and looked down on all that kinds of magical or satanic stuff, but I had no idea just how bad she'd fly off the handle when she caught us watching freaking Scooby-Doo, of all things. Bearing in mind it was my friend who put the show on in the first place, but when my friend's mom wanders in to see what we're watching, she just assumes it was me that put it on. She yanks me up from sitting, then proceeds to scream in my face that I was disgusting and that I was going to hell for making her daughter watch that kind of filth. And right as I'm about to burst into tears, she slaps me so hard across the side of the head. I just lost it, bolted up to her bedroom, locked myself inside, and called my dad. She's banging on the door telling me she's going to beat me for being a sinner. My dad can hear this and just yells, I'm on my way into the phone before passing it to my mom. I was so scared, more scared than I think I ever was during my entire childhood, and the minutes of waiting in that locked bedroom for my dad to show up were some of the longest of my whole life. When he showed up, I was in the back bedroom, so the only way I knew he was there was when my friend's mom answered a banging at the door and started screaming at someone. I ran down the stairs, and as soon as he saw me, my dad basically pushed the woman on her butt, 
grabbed me, and then we got out of there. It was a whole drama after that. The police were involved, charges were filed, but the worst part, it totally soured my friendship with the girl who I was having the sleepover with. I wasn't ever allowed to visit her house, and her mom pretty much ordered her not to hang out with me anymore. It was sad, really sad, but I guess that's just how life is, sometimes. Please don't think I'm trying to throw myself a pity party here because I'm doing much better in my adult life. But back when I was a kid, I had an incredibly toxic home life, and as a result, I went to school basically with little to no social skills. I made just one friend, and even then it was only on accident because she was being nice to me after I tripped and broke my toy on the bus. Her name was Rachel. Rachel's BFF was named Emily, and Emily was the prettiest, coolest girl in class. So imagine my delight when one day I find myself getting an invite to Emily's birthday sleepover. To this day I can remember how excited I was. My first sleepover. It was indescribably validating. I beamed at that invitation over and over again like it was a trophy or something, and begged my mom to give me a ride to the sleepover early. I didn't want to miss a single minute of it. Then, on the night of the sleepover, I found it wasn't quite as enjoyable as I thought it would be. It was a real fun atmosphere and all, but Emily and Rachel weren't exactly being very warm with me, and I could really obviously detect it. Then, right as I'm lying on my back with a pillow under my head, just relaxing, I feel Emily straddle my stomach while Rachel seems to hold my legs down. Emily then grabs the pillow out from under my head, shoves it over my face, then proceeds to tell me how ugly I am and how she never wanted to invite me. It hurt. Emotionally, I mean. It cut really, really deep. But that feeling was nothing to the one I felt when I realized I couldn't breathe. I struggled and struggled, but still that horrid little girl kept that pillow over my face until I felt myself passing out. It was only when her mom walked in to see what all the fuss was about that she took it away from my face. I still can't see their names without remembering how awful that memory is to me, but I'm glad to say that there were definitely repercussions. Rachel was grounded for a long time for letting it happen. I know that, but Emily ended up getting like a psychological evaluation or whatever which revealed that she had some serious personality disorders. This was all part of her being arrested as a juvenile and she only narrowly avoided attempted murder charges. It caused a huge thing in our community, and it was so bad that, in the end, Emily's parents had to just pack up their family and leave town. But before I end this, let me say it again. I'm not looking for sympathy here. All that stuff is long in the past. Childhood was not kind to me, but I promise you, these days I'm in a much better place and surrounded by all the friends a girl could possibly wish for. And only two of them are cats. I'm a female, and at the time this story occurred, I was 15. My best friend Ellie would spend a lot of time in my house. I kind of just assumed that this was because she had two younger siblings that she didn't really get along with well. And the father wasn't in the picture, and their mom was gone most of the time. Every weekend, Ellie would stay at my house. On this particular weekend, I'd asked Ellie if maybe we could stay at her house instead. I was just kind of wanting a break from my parents, and I had never stayed over at Ellie's house before. Her mother said that it would be fine and that she wasn't going to be home much anyway. We went to Ellie's house straight after school on a Friday. We sat down on the couch and we had watched some TV for a bit. After a while, we decided we wanted a snack and we went into the kitchen to see what we could find. They had a side door, and their kitchen was open with a screen on the outside. I was very startled when I saw a man standing in front of the screen door, looking inside. He looked to be in his late 30s, and he was really dirty and shaggy looking. I actually wondered if he was homeless. Once we made direct eye contact with him, he then said, Well, well, well. Hello there, young ladies. Dave, Ellie said. She told this guy Dave that her mom wasn't there. The man replied back, Yeah, she never is. Who's your little friend here? 
He asked as he creepily looked me up and down. She told him I was her friend and that we were just hanging out having a sleepover. Ellie seemed uncomfortable, and I was too. He stood there for a moment just smiling at us when he then said, So are boys allowed? I'm sure a couple of cuties like you have boyfriends coming over. We grew increasingly uncomfortable and Ellie told him that she had to watch her brother and sister for the night and that her mom would be home later. I knew that wasn't true though. Her siblings were staying at her dad's that weekend and her mom would be going out with her boyfriend so most likely she wouldn't be coming home. The man was still standing at the door smiling at us. He then said, Oh well, I guess. Tell your mom I stopped by. See you sexy ladies later. When the man walked away, I asked Ellie what was that all about. She told me that Dave was her neighbor. Apparently her mom had gone on a date with him several years ago when they first moved in. Her mother wasn't impressed with Dave and there was no second date. She said that he was cheap, had bad hygiene, not at all interesting, and was far too forward sexually. I guess this Dave character would stop by frequently trying to get the mom's attention and then flirt with her, much to everyone in the household's dismay. Ellie also said in the last couple of years, he seemed to start taking more interest in her, even making the horrific comment about how she's grown up enough to wear bras now. I was totally horrified. What a creep. We tried to relax some and forget about the creepy neighbor. We ate some junk food, watched some of our favorite shows, and also took some quizzes out of teen magazines. It was getting dark and we were starting to want dinner, so we ordered a large cheese pizza. Not even 10 minutes later after the pizza had arrived, there was a knock at the front door. We were both really surprised as it was going on 9pm at this point and we weren't expecting anyone. Ellie got up and looked out the peephole. She looked right back at me wide-eyed. She put her finger up to her mouth and told me to be quiet. There was another knock at the door, then a voice. It was Dave. Girls, I know you're home, he said. We were both frozen in fear. Then Dave the Creep said something along the lines of that he knew we were alone and saw that we were hungry for a pizza, and so he thought he'd bring us a large sausage. Yeah, I know. Cringe. After a few minutes of not responding, Dave said something about us being stuck up little girls and then left. We went around the house closing all the blinds and making sure all the doors were locked. We were so scared that we barely had the volume of the TV up and kept the room lit with one tiny dim lamp out of fear of Dave seeing or hearing us. Once it got to be around 10.30, we were really fed up with having to sit still in the dark. Ellie got up and peeked out the window at Dave's house. She said that all of his lights were off, so he probably went out or went to bed. We felt comfortable enough to turn on some lights and relax a bit, so we put on some music and chatted some. We were sitting on the piano bench in front of the dining room windows when all of a sudden we then heard a tapping outside the window. I guess we had only closed the shades halfway because when we looked over, you guessed it, there was Dave peeking in. He held up a six pack of beer saying that he knew Ellie's mom wasn't home and that we should let him in so we can all party together. I guess Ellie had enough at this point because she stood up and yelled at him, no, and that he needed to leave. Dave had a completely blank look on his face, and then he said, You know I can just come in, right? Ellie then yelled at him that she had spoken with her mom, and she was calling the police. Well, at that point, Creeper Dave started to back away, saying he was just kidding and that we needed to calm down. Ellie stood her ground until she knew Dave was in his house, then proceeded to call her mom's boyfriend's house. She told her mom all the creepy things Dave had been doing, but her mom didn't believe us, and she thought we were making things up. She said we should just go to bed and everything would be fine. Ellie was so upset. We ended up locking ourselves upstairs in her mother's bedroom. We didn't have any more problems with Dave that night and we finally got some sleep. After that night, as you can imagine, we decided to just go back to sleepovers at my house. And I think that's for the best. Before I start this, I just want to say that I in no way blame this on my friend or her mother at all. The story takes place around two years ago, during the summer of 2019. I was 14 years old at the time and I had a really big group of friends that I would go to the pool with like almost every day. We all lived only a few houses away from each other, except for about three of the girls. There were eight of us. The day was like every other day, 
We woke up, put on our bathing suits, and we had our friend Ryan's mom take us to the pool. She happened to have a minivan that could fit us all. We got to the pool around 11 a.m. and swam until about 9 p.m. when the pool closed. Since all of our parents were super close and we still wanted to keep the fun going, we decided to crash at our friend Ava's house. She had a huge downstairs basement that was soundproof because her dad used to teach guitar and drum lessons to people all the time down there. Two of our friends, Carly and Erin, didn't really want to go because they felt really tired and dizzy for being out all day and night. So we said our goodbyes to the two of them as their parents came and picked them up. And it only took about four minutes for Ava's mom to come get us. She had a smaller car, so we had to squeeze in a little more. When we got to Ava's house, we came inside and thanked her mom for driving us before going to get some snacks from the kitchen. As we walked into the kitchen, we could see Ava's stepdad, David. None of us really liked David since he kind of had a reputation of being really creepy towards us and making rude comments to us whenever our parents came to pick us up. We walked to the cabinets and grabbed all we needed and proceeded to pile down the stairs to the basement. Let me give you a quick layout of the basement. As soon as you walk down the stairs, to your right is sort of a kitchen and work room, and then to your left is a basement living room, and then once you walk past the sofas, there's a pool table. On the left of the pool table, there's a hallway where on the left is a bathroom and storage room, and then to your right is a bedroom. All of us really smelled of sunscreen and chlorine, so we split into groups of two and went to each different room to change out of the bathing suits and into clothes. The basement was kind of creepy, and none of us wanted to be alone in any of the rooms due to the previous paranormal experiences we've had there. Ava always had spare shirts that she'd let us wear that used to be her dad's, and since most of us were five foot two and shorter, the shirts covered us enough that we didn't need to wear shorts. And if you're wondering, yes, we washed our hair. We would usually take turns taking a shower, but we were so tired that we just tilted our heads back over the tub and then took turns washing each other's hair. Once we finished with that, we walked to the basement bedroom and got comfortable. We made bracelets, talked about drama and the new school year coming up, eat junk food, drink Pepsi, and then watched the new season of Stranger Things. After around three hours of this, our friend Ryder was asleep on the bed while the rest of us sat on the floor talking. While Ava was halfway through her sentence, we heard the stairs of the basement then creaking. All of us were silent. Ava said it could just be one of her cats or something. But before she could even finish, we then heard around six more steps from the basement stairs area. Ryan, the oldest of us, seemingly the most freaked out, quietly walked to the door and locked it while me and my friend Molly went to turn off the lights. We waited around five minutes, the only light coming from the computer screen that we'd been watching Netflix on. We quietly whispered about what the noise could be until we heard sliding footsteps coming into the hallway of the basement. Me and Ava grabbed onto each other as everyone else fell silent. After about two minutes of hearing nothing, we all then moved to the bed. While doing this, we managed to wake up Ryder, who then loudly asked, What the hell are y'all doing? Ryan covered his mouth with his hands while telling him what was going on. Ryder, who hates when people wake him up, sat up and told us to calm down as he walked to the basement bedroom door and unlocked it. He swung the door open, and what we saw made us all stiff as a board with fear. There in the doorway was Ava's stepdad. Her stepdad was terrifying. He was six foot four, short brownish hair, heavy set, and he had these square glasses that could reflect about anything. Me and everybody else in the room screamed at the top of our lungs as Ryder slammed the door in his face, locked it, and ran into the bed into me and Ryan's arms. We all stayed as silent as possible as we waited for what felt like hours as we heard Ava's stepdad groaning and asking if he could join us. Our friend Izzy and I began to cry while Ava called her mom to come down and get him. After I'd say about 45 minutes, all was silent and we ended up falling asleep piled up on top one another. We woke to the sound of Ava's mom knocking on the door. We then unlocked it and let her in. She then explained to us how after she brought David back up, he then told her, that many young girls down in the dark basement all by themselves is really dangerous. Anything could happen and no one would hear anything. Thank goodness those two boys were in there and were smart enough to lock the door in case anyone tried to do anything. When her mom told us this, I felt sick to my stomach. When I looked over, I saw the look of pure horror and disbelief on everyone's faces. After that, we all decided to go home. I'm 16 years old now and Ava's stepdad passed away due to the coronavirus. Me and those girls aren't as close anymore, 
But that night and all the other experiences we've had since then have stayed between us. And they probably always will. Sometimes you need a bit of fun in your life. And certain people can definitely make it brighter. I'm talking about friends. Close friends. This story has been in the back of my mind for about two years now. And it's one of the most terrifying experiences of my entire life that I really want to forget. It occasionally pops into my mind and it still gives me the shivers to this day. It was the end of another school week, a Friday, and as a lot of us teenagers do, we decided to have a sleepover on the weekend. My friends agreed with me and we happily walked home, talking about what we should do the next day and where we should go and all that stuff that you'd expect to talk about. One of my other friends said that we should have a sleepover at his place. I'm not revealing their real names for privacy reasons, so for this story, I'll call them X and L. And in case you're confused, it was X that said he wanted us to sleep over at his place. I quietly walked home as I and L split up to go to our own houses to pack up our belongings for the sleepover. I grabbed out my bathroom equipment, sleeping bag, and fresh clothes, and all the other stuff you would need for a sleepover. Once I was finished packing my bag, I had called both X and L on our group chat and told X that I had packed and I would asked my parents if I was allowed to come and told them they said yes, and L said the same thing as me. We were all excited and X said that he'll be waiting at the park down outside his house to meet, since the park was only two houses down from his place. I casually walked to the park, which was approximately ten minutes away. Right as we got there, I would saw X and L already at the park. I gave them both a wave and we all walked to X's house. We all got inside and made ourselves comfortable with our sleeping bags in the living room because X's room was, well, a tad bit tiny. I think that the time was somewhere around 12.30 a.m. I remember it raining ever so slightly. We were all laughing and giggling about certain events that had happened at school that day, but I guess that isn't really relevant to the story. I told them that we should probably all go to sleep since it was extremely late and that I was really tired. L then replied, All right then, I mean, I guess it is a pretty shitty night after all. We had all started laughing at that response and it eventually got to the point where we started talking less and less and then eventually falling asleep from boredom. However, I didn't really fall asleep that night. I was rolling over in my bag and just trying to get into a comfortable position to sleep in, but had no luck falling asleep. I had my eyes wide open, staring at the blank ceiling. I looked at both X and L, who were both pretty wiped out into slumber. I got out of my sleeping bag as quietly as I possibly could and then went into the kitchen to get a drink. But after I had my drink of water, I had heard some type of noise coming from a wall. I didn't really make it out at first and I kind of had a difficult time trying to figure out what it was and it was coming from the living room. I carefully went into the living room and then tried my best not to step on L. I was standing in the middle of the room trying my best to find out where the hell the sound was coming from. Okay, to give you a bit of context, if you enter the front door of the house, the living room is in the first room that you enter, and the left side of the living room where you enter is a giant window. Well, the tapping sound was coming from that window. My heart was starting to speed up now, but what was the only logical option you may ask? To look through the window. I told myself to just go up to the window and see what it was, so I proceeded to do so. I stopped. There was something else. The windows were closed by blinds. I leaned my ear closer to the window. Now along with the tapping, I could also hear breathing. I could barely just hear it over the rain. Very slow breathing. I couldn't say anything. I very slowly backed away from the window. I frantically woke up both X and L in a panic. They both said to me, What? What is it? In a grainy, tired voice. I told them to shush themselves and to listen. However, the tapping and breathing soon stopped. L then said, Dude, I don't hear a thing. I told them what I heard, but they didn't believe me. I was getting mad. But then L suggested, Why don't you just go outside and check? I immediately said something along the lines of, fine, I'll go out there. In fact, 
why don't you both come out with me just to be sure? I opened the door quietly and motioned my friends to come outside with me. We got to the window outside the house and nothing. There was nothing there. X said to me, I told you, I knew there wasn't going to be anything there. We both talked about it for a bit outside and X said I was crazy, but the story doesn't end there. Out of the blue, L nervously said, Wait, who's that guy over there? We all looked and there was a dark silhouette that was just standing still a few houses down the street. He was probably about 5 foot 5 and he was wearing a raincoat from what I remember. My friends both looked at me, knowing that I wasn't crazy. The guy was just staring at us, not moving a muscle, but he then started laughing in a sort of sinister kind of way. Within that moment, I said softly, Go for the backyard gate, right now, do it. The guy continued to stare at us while we both slid slowly to the gate, which was very close. Suddenly the guy just full on sprinted right toward us without warning. My life was in slow motion. I dashed for the gate. All of us got in and I was actually the last one to get in, and then I locked the gate. The guy ran into the gate with such force, but the gate didn't budge. The gate and fence were really high, and he couldn't possibly get over it. He then started banging and screaming at the gate, yelling things like, Come on out here and I'll kill you, you dumb teenagers. And I'll honestly never forget that sentence. We made a run for it to the back door of the house and woke X's dad up. He bolted straight outside and said the guy made a run for it and was already halfway down the street. He chased after him, screaming for him to get back here. X's dad called the police straight away. They arrived a little while later with cops. Three searched the area while one stopped to talk to me about it. The three cops found nothing except for a long and sharp kitchen knife that was dropped outside the front lawn. I shuddered. One of the policemen asked me if I knew what he looked like, but I couldn't make anything out other than he was somewhere around 5'5 five five and wearing a raincoat. He wasn't seen again after that, and he hasn't come back. But the police that day said they found dirty boot marks right outside the front door. But the really creepy part about the boot marks outside the door is that apparently that door had a peephole. And that peephole could make you see through both ways. Plus X's house is old, and that guy was possibly spying on us through it. Moral of the story is be very careful during the night. Because anything can happen if you're not careful. We're going back many, many years for this, but I grew up in Northern California in quite a poor rural area. Some of my best friends from elementary and middle school live like 10 to 15 miles away, so on weekends, instead of just going over to visit for the day, we'd have sleepovers to save our parents driving these crazy round trips. So I had this one friend called Star, whose parents were like old school hippies. Their house always smelled of patchouli, they were vegan before... Vegan was even really a thing, and aside from a few unusual recreational activities, they were basically just as good as being parents as any other couple. They were sweet, loving, and attentive, and I always had a ball whenever I went to sleepovers at their place, mainly because they'd let us stay outdoors in a tent at night, which was just such a huge adventure for a little group of preteen tomboys. Anyways, this one night we're staying in a tent in the backyard, but it was a backyard that extended to one side of the house. Where we're camped is in the view of the TV room window, so Star's mom and dad could keep an eye on us, but it also meant we could see the driveway from the flap of our tent. It was summertime, so it was still incredibly warm at night, so we ended up leaving the tent flat unzipped to let some cool air in. It obviously wasn't open all the way, because bugs, but we can still see outside the tent. Then, in the middle of the night... Star shakes me awake and whispers, There's someone in the driveway. I'm thinking it might have been her big brother, who was a few years older than us and was attending college. But when I suggested that, she said, No, it's a bunch of people, look. I start getting real anxious hearing that, so I quietly creep up to the tent flap to peek out. And that's when I saw that Star was exactly right. In the little bit of moonlight that we had, I literally lost count of the number of people I saw creeping up her driveway. 
It was seriously one of the scariest moments of my life, mainly because there was absolutely nothing to do but keep as quiet as possible. We couldn't call the cops. This was way before cell phones. We couldn't warn Star's parents without revealing our presence. We were just powerless, forced to watch people who obviously didn't have good intentions slowly approaching Star's house. I think in the end, Star just broke, and in a move you could either call real brave or real stupid, she just ran out of the tent shouting, Get away from my house, and then, Mom, Dad, call the cops. As soon as she starts screaming, a bunch of flashlights burst into life, obviously held by the guy sneaking up the driveway. And oh my god, there were so many of them. At first glance in the darkness, it looked no more than about five or six people, but when they all turned their flashlights on, it was clear the number was more like 15 or 20. I just hear, Sheriff's Department, show me your hands. And that was incredibly confusing because we were all about calling the cops to get help, but like, the cops were already here? Anyway, Star does as she's told, while me and our friends start climbing out of the tent with our hands in the air. That's when the person approaching us started saying, Jesus, they're just kids, man. And with them being closer, I could see that they really were cops, with caps and badges and all patches on their arms, all that stuff. Then I hear, go, 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 get in there. And the cops start bashing the front door to the house in while other cops fanned around the backyard and headed towards one of the barns. We were scared, obviously, but we're so focused on just staying down and watching that we're not really freaking out too bad. But when the cops start dragging Star's mom and dad out of the house and arresting them, she had to be restrained by the cop that was guarding us. After that, the cops drove me and our friend back to our respective homes. Then, I don't know what they did with Star. I think they took her to her grandma's or her aunt's or whatever. Then a few days later, we find out that Star's mom and dad had been growing something they shouldn't have in one of their barns. I get that it was illegal and stuff, but the aftermath was just so sad. Star had to go live with her relatives because her parents were sent off to prison for a few years. It was messed up. And I get that the cops were just doing their job and stuff, but it was definitely one of the scariest times of my life, seeing all those figures in black just creeping towards my friend's house. I'm a female and I worked at Chuck E. Cheese during my senior year of high school. Plenty of weird things happened in my time working there, but one was particularly creepy. I had already been working there for a while, but one night after school, I was working a 4 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. shift. My main job was usually to stand behind the counter and help any customers. Occasionally, I would clean stuff too, but for this night, I was mainly behind the counter. About an hour in, I remember some guy came up and started talking to me. He came off as a little too friendly and slightly creepy to me. I even wondered if he was drunk after a while based on the way he was talking. He told me he was there with his son and had given his son a bunch of tokens so he would probably be there for a while. I was nice and friendly back to him at first, but after he talked to me for a good five minutes straight, it seemed a little weird. He also started to ask me more personal questions, and once I saw there was somebody in line behind him, I let the man know I needed to help the other customers. After this, he finally walked away, but he ended up coming back and trying to talk to me some more about an hour later. I didn't want anything to do with this guy and kind of tried to avoid him after that. When it was finally almost 9 p.m. and we were getting ready to close, I happened to notice that the man was still there. He was just sitting kind of near the exit and he was all by himself. I realized he must have been there for at least four hours. He was looking at me and I quickly looked away when we made awkward eye contact. There really wasn't anybody else there besides him so it was really weird. I decided to go out into the arcade and see if anybody else was there at all. We closed in five minutes now, and I would have to let anybody still there know that we were closing and they would have to leave. When I went over there, though, nobody was in the arcade at all. I returned to the front desk after that and saw the guy still sitting there and looking at me again. I thought that he said he was there with his son, but I realized maybe he didn't have a son at all. It was a creepy thought, but I really just wanted the guy to leave. I saw one of my coworkers, Aaron, start to walk over to the man and say that we were now closing. I saw the man talk with Aaron for a second, and then he left, which was a huge relief for me to see that. 
After that, it was 9 p.m., and I would get off in just 30 minutes. I stayed after to clean a little bit, and did my usual cleaning of the arcade area, and then some of the dining areas. When 9.30 came, I was finally done, and I clocked out and left. I walked out the front door to the parking lot, which was practically empty. It was dark and quiet out there, but as I was approaching my car, I suddenly heard something behind me. It sounded like footsteps. I kept walking, but realized that they were fast approaching me. I turned around and saw a man walking extremely fast in my direction. Almost immediately, I recognized him as the man who was talking to me inside the Chuck E. Cheese. I ran for my car, and luckily, I already had my keys in my hand. I was able to unlock my car and get inside before he reached me. As quickly as I could, I locked the doors, but the man reached my window a second later and then started knocking on it. He tried my door handle as well. I yelled at the man to go away, but he didn't listen. At this point, I really wanted to drive away, but the man seemed to be holding onto my door handle. I began honking the horn on my car repeatedly. This went on for probably 30 seconds straight, and finally, I noticed a car on the road outside of the parking lot we were in start to slow down. They seemed to be wondering what was going on, and this caused the man to back away a little. As soon as he did, I sped off. I drove all the way home. And once I got home, I called my boss and told her all about it. I gave a description of the man and was told if I ever saw him again to call her. Luckily, I never did see him again. The first and only time I ever went to Chuck E. Cheese was back in the year 2005. I was a little kid at the time. I remember that my older brother got invited to one of his friend's birthday parties, which was going to be at the Chuck E. Cheese. My parents were invited as well, so they said that I could come with. I was excited to go there because I had always wanted to. It seemed like so much fun with the arcade games, the pizza, and everything. I remember that the party was on a Sunday, I think, and when we got there, my parents got a pizza, and my brother went to hang out with his friends. I knew some of the kids that were there, but they were mostly my brother's friends, so I could kind of do my own thing. My brother's friend who the party was for was named Tyler, and his parents got a bunch of tokens for everyone. They gave me a little paper cup with a bunch of tokens in it, and I began going around playing some of the machines. I was trying to find the best machines that would have the best payout of tickets. I saw that the Chuck E. Cheese had some pretty cool prizes you could win with the tickets. After playing maybe half the arcade games they had in there, I found this one in the corner that I really liked a lot. I was getting on a winning streak, and after the second time playing it, I had quite a few tickets and played it for a third time. I was right in the middle of the game when all of a sudden, the whole thing suddenly went black and froze. It was really strange. I pushed some of the buttons and messed around with it a little bit, but nothing worked. The screen was completely black and nothing I did seemed to affect it. I was a little kid, so I didn't really know how the machines worked, but I just figured it was broken. Then I saw a man appear next to the machine. He was wearing a shirt with a Chuck E. Cheese logo and asked me what had happened. I told him the machine was broken and he took a look at it and saw how it wasn't working. He pushed a few of the buttons and then went around to the back of the machine. It seemed like he was working on it and a short time later he returned and said that it appeared as though the machine was broken and it would be out of order for a while. Then he apologized to me and told me he could get me the tickets that I would have won and some extra tokens for the trouble. I was glad to hear this because I would have already won a good amount of tickets from the game before it broke. The guy started to walk away and told me to follow him. We went off to the side of the room and then into a hallway which led to the back. I stopped at the entrance of the hallway that said employees only, but then I was told to keep going. I followed the guy down the hall and then we reached a side door. The guy then backed up and grabbed my arm tightly. He opened the door which turned out to be an exit of the building. I could see outside and he pulled my arm and forced me to follow him. I asked the man what was going on, but he didn't answer me. I was starting to panic. The guy had a strong grip on my arm, and it looked like we were going out to his car. I really didn't want to go any further, and I was desperate. As we got closer, I suddenly took my leg and kicked the man right in the groin area. It really took him by surprise, and he dropped to his knees for a second, and his grip became much looser. I pulled away from the man and started running back, but I decided to go around to the front of the Chuck E. Cheese. Once I had made it around to the front, I went in the entrance doors and ran back inside to my parents. When I got there, they saw me and asked me what was wrong. 
After I told them what had happened, they decided to call the police and talk with the managers as well. I remember I had to talk with the police for a while. Looking back at that day, I realized that the man didn't work at Chuck E. Cheese at all, and he most likely just unplugged the game I was playing himself. If you really like my content and want to support me, please like this video and click the subscribe button. It helps me to grow my channel as essential in reaching a wider audience. Most of you watching my videos aren't subscribed to my channel, and that's why my animations can't reach their full potential. They aren't recommended to more people who would surely love my content as much as you do. You can always unsubscribe at any moment. Thank you in advance, and enjoy the rest of the video. I used to work at a Chuck E. Cheese. I enjoyed the job a lot. It was a fun place to work, maybe because I had a lot of good memories of going there as a kid. I would do a little bit of everything there, including quite a bit of maintenance and cleaning. One night, I was working on a quieter evening. I was in the process of cleaning up a table area when I saw a customer approaching me. I stopped what I was doing and saw that there was a pretty average looking guy standing in front of me. The guy told me that he had just been in the men's bathroom in the back and he wanted to let me know that it was really dirty and could use a cleaning. I told the guy thanks for letting me know and then he walked away. Keeping the bathroom clean was one of my jobs and it wasn't one of my favorite parts of the job, but it actually usually wasn't that bad. After I was done clearing the table, I walked down the hallway to our little cleaning closet where I got a cleaning cart that I would use for the restrooms. By this time of night, the place wasn't too busy and there were only a few kids and parents in the arcade or eating areas. When I got to the men's bathroom in the back, I went inside saw that it was empty and nobody else was in, which was good, but when I looked around, everything seemed fine. I was happy to see this, but also confused. The more I looked around after going all around the bathroom, I saw that it was completely clean, and nothing was dirty at all. After that, I took my cart and went to leave, but when I tried opening the bathroom door to get out, it wouldn't move. All I had to do was push it open, but it seemed like there was someone or something on the other side blocking it and holding it back because no matter how hard I pushed, it just wouldn't budge. I kept trying, but nothing was happening. Then suddenly, all the lights went out. It was pitch black in there, and I couldn't see a thing. I kept on trying the door, but nothing was happening. I started banging on the door and yelling at that point, hoping that somebody would hear me. Finally, after about a minute straight of this, the door suddenly burst open, and I went flying out there and fell flat on my face on the other side of the doorway. I looked around, but didn't see anybody nearby. I saw one of my coworkers, Jake, not too far away, kind of walking towards me. He came up and asked if I was okay, looking confused. I told him what had just happened to me. Jake said he had seen me go through the door, and he had heard somebody yelling, and that's why he was approaching the bathroom. He said when he got towards the bathroom doors, he saw a large man running away. I was really creeped out when I heard this. I actually looked around after that for the guy who had told me that the bathrooms were dirty but I couldn't find him anywhere. I ended up just working the rest of the night like normal after that. But I've often wondered what exactly happened there. When I was around the age of 20, I had just recently gotten my first ever paying job at my 24-hour local Taco Bell. The job was okay, it wasn't a well-paying job, and the other workers were somewhat rude, but it's better than not having a job. My first few months of working there went pretty well of me being the cashier. I'd collect the money and take customers' orders, and the job was actually pretty easy, and I was fine with it. One day, my manager told me that I had to work the night shift for a week. 8 p.m. to 3 a.m. I was pretty upset, but I couldn't argue with him, so he took the shift. The first few nights went okay. After around 11 p.m., people would stop coming in, and I had maybe three or four people come in at around 1 for a taco or something. One night, it was around 12.30 a.m., and it was just me and two other workers who made the food. I was sitting down in one of the chairs playing a game on my phone when I heard the door open. I looked to see a man, I'd say in his mid-forties with a hat and jacket on. 
He had a long beard and his hair was all messy and greasy. I politely welcomed him and asked if I could take his order, but he didn't say anything. He just stood in front of me looking at me with a blank expression on his face. I assumed that he was on something or had some sort of disability, but just then he started to walk away and out the front door. I have to admit that I was a bit freaked out but really thought nothing of it and continued to do my shift and whatnot. However, I then started to get the feeling that I was being watched somehow and was getting paranoid. Finally, 2am came around and the other employee, we'll call her Michelle, came in for her shift. Her and I were really good friends so we chatted for a bit while I was finishing cleaning the counters. At some point in the conversation, she said that she'd be right back and that she had to use the restroom. A few minutes went by which then turned into 10 minutes and eventually into 20. I then thought to myself, what could she possibly be doing in there that's taking her so long? At this point, I was starting to get worried and thought that something might have happened to her. I slowly walked over to the woman's restroom and opened the door just a bit. However, I noticed that all of the lights in the woman's restroom were off when they should have been on at all times. I turned them on and yelled out, Michelle, uh, are you okay? There was no response from her. I wanted to let her have privacy, but I had the strong feeling that something wasn't right. I went inside calling Michelle again and again. Once I passed a stall, I heard what sounded like a light cry and whimpering. I opened the stall door and was shook with fear. I saw the same exact man from earlier holding Michelle while putting his hand around her mouth. That's not the most disturbing part though. The man was holding a large knife against Michelle's throat. Her eyes were filled with fear and was crying like crazy. She was scared for her life. The man then said in a raspy voice, If you don't get all of that money from the register, I will slit her throat and blood will be all over this room. I was so scared that I couldn't even speak. I could tell that the more time I stood there, the more angry he got. I ran to the register and took all of the cash out in a bag and went to the bathroom and gave it to him. He then let go of her and pushed her to me. He ran out the front door, never to be seen again. All the while, Michelle was crying on me and thanking me for saving her life. We of course called the cops, but nothing be ever came of the man. And the cameras we had in the store didn't help as the footage was too blurry to identify who the man was. Michelle and I quit a week later and both started working at a grocery store. However, sometimes I think that what would have happened to her had I not went into the bathroom to check on her. That still freaks me out till this day. When I was around 10 years old, the most horrifying thing happened to me. I was still in elementary school at the time and I was definitely no popular kid. I had a few acquaintances here and there but I would overall not really talk to anyone. One day, my mom said that she was going to pick me up from school early that day as we were going on a vacation to visit family that was about 6 hours away. That day, at around 1, I left school early and got into my mom's car. She had packed all the clothes, bathroom utilities, and stuff you would need for a long road trip. For the first few hours, I was listening to my iPad and eventually ended up taking a nap. Around, I'd say, the 4 hour mark, it was basically around 5 or 6 p.m and it was getting dark fast and we both were hungry and wouldn't be at our relative's house for a good two hours so my mom and I decided to stop at a nearby Taco Bell. Not my favorite fast food restaurant but I could live with it. We stepped inside and placed our orders and once we got our food we then sat down. So I'm sitting down talking to my mom about what we'd be doing once we got there but she didn't seem too focused on what I was saying. She was looking over me in different directions as if she were worried or confused about something. I looked behind me but saw nothing and brushed it off as her being paranoid. So 10 minutes goes by and my mom says she has to step out to take an important phone call and that she'd be watching me through the window and that she'd be right back. So she's on the phone and I'm minding my business when I smell something extremely foul. I look to my left to see a man in his late 50s looking down at me. He said in a deep voice, Hey young lady, my name is John, what's yours? 
My mom was very strict about the whole stranger danger thing and I was taught never to talk to strangers. This guy was very often sketchy. He had a long gray beard, cracked yellow teeth, and looked like he haven't been to the gym in years. He said again, Come on honey, tell me your name, I would love to get to know you. Just then, I saw my mom thankfully walking back into the restaurant and he must have caught my eye and walked away. I decided not to tell my mom about any detail of what just happened as she takes everything very seriously and told her we should go after she was done eating. A few minutes went by and my mom told me that if I had to use the restroom that I should go now as we had a long way ahead of us and probably wouldn't be stopping anywhere else. I got up and walked over to the restroom and opened the door. I was about to open one of the stalls when I heard a very familiar voice say, Hey Rachel, wanna come home with me? I have some candy you'll like. I froze in fear and realized that it was the same man from earlier. I did not respond. I just simply walked out of the door and my mom and I then left. However, as I was in the car while my mom was pulling out of the parking spot, I looked out the window and there he was. He was still inside waving at me with that creepy smile. I didn't look back and I didn't tell my mom. I have absolutely no idea as to what his intentions were. Why was he in the woman's restroom? What would he have done if he had gotten a hold of me? The part that still scares me till this day is how he knew my name. That still sends shivers up my spine just thinking about it till this day. I hope I don't see that creepy man again. My name is Daniel and I was about 20 years old when this happened to me at a Taco Bell. I've always been the type of person who would eat fast food almost every day. Whether it would be for lunch or dinner or even a snack, I would almost go out for fast food at least once a day. I know, not that healthy, but that's just how I live. One night, I had just finished my shift from my full-time job and working over 8 hours at a car dealership. I was driving and planning to head home, but thought about doing my daily routine of getting some fast food. The dealership I worked at is kind of in a rural area, which I guess is in the outskirts of my city, which means that there aren't a lot of places around. My house is about a 20 mile drive, depending if there's traffic or not. Anyway, I didn't see a McDonald's or a Burger King or anything like that. However, I decided to take a different way, hoping I would find a place to eat that was open late. I ended up seeing a Taco Bell up ahead. Not my favorite fast food place, but at least it's food and I couldn't drive home without anything in my stomach. I pulled into the parking lot, got out of my car and walked in. I ordered my food, sat down at a table and enjoyed the tacos I was having. I was there for about a good 15 minutes before I was done and planning on leaving. I walked out of the door with my phone in hand, texting one of my coworkers when some guy ran up to me out of breath. He looked tired and thirsty and was very sweaty as if he just ran a marathon. He said to me while still hyperventilating, uh, hey, hey man, uh, do, do you think you'd just spare me a few dollars? Uh, I just need a soda or something. I told him that I wasn't sure as I don't really carry cash often but that I would check in the car for a few dollars. I was in my car looking for some money in the back seat when I hear my passenger car door open and then close. I looked to see the man in the passenger seat holding a gun in his hands pointing it directly at my face. You could imagine the panic I was in and my blood turned cold and it didn't help that he had a very angry look on his face. He said these exact words, Now, you are going to listen to exactly as I say or I won't hesitate to shoot you in the head and blood in the brain matter will be all over the inside of your car. I remained calm and said, Okay, so what do you want me to do here? He said to pull up the GPS on my phone and to drive to a specific address. At this point, I'm pissing myself and hoping that one of the employees at Taco Bell would see this, but they didn't notice, and I didn't want to risk trying anything to get help. I put in the given address and it was about 10 miles. I put my car into drive and we start making our way over there. The more I started to look at him, the more angry he got and the closer the gun got to my head. I then came to a red light and decided to make a decision. 
I'm a pretty big guy, 6 foot 5, and when I was 10, my grandfather would always take me hunting and even taught me how to take a gun away from someone before he unfortunately passed away. I decided to listen to my grandpa's advice, but it's been so long since he taught me how to take a gun away from someone, but I had to try it and I knew this was my chance. I tried to remember the steps and attempted to grab the gun from him. The gun eventually dropped to the floor, but thankfully I was faster than he was and I grabbed the gun before he did. I pointed at him and said, Now you listen to me, if you don't get out of my car, I will shoot you. He then got out of my car and started walking along the sidewalk, never to be seen again. I finally made it home safe and I felt relieved. I then gave the gun to the authorities, but I don't know what happened to it after that. And I still have no idea where he was leading me to, and what would have happened had he gotten the gun first when it fell. I still have nightmares about it happening. So, I guess the lesson is to be careful out there, and not to go to Taco Bell or any other fast food restaurant so late at night. You never know what could happen. I've been urged by those close to me to share my account of a recent life-changing event I experienced while working the drive through window at my fast food job. Until this happened, I had yet to fall victim to the irrational anger some carry around all day inside of them. I was unaware of how easily they can be triggered, and now that I have seen it firsthand, I'm not sure I'll ever be able to fully trust another human again. Although, at this time it is still very difficult for me to relive the event, I am encouraged that, to do so through this post, I may be able to begin to take charge of my life again. I guess I'll start at the beginning in order to make what came next make more sense. My name is Zoe Marie, but my friends call me Zoe. I'm currently 17 and will soon graduate high school a year early because I was allowed to skip ahead of grade when I was younger. In order to instill a strong work ethic into their young daughter, my parents encouraged me to get a job once I had turned 16. Not being one that wanted to disappoint my parents, I soon found a part-time job at a chain burger and fries restaurant near my home. I would often ride my bike the two miles after school and work a few hours during the weekdays and longer shifts on weekend evenings. So I had always had all of my things paid for up until that time. Seeing each check filled me with a mixture of awe and achievement. These feelings appear to have done exactly what my parents had hoped and fired my will to work even harder. I'm not sure if this desire spawned from a place of greed. I'm sure the argument could be made. Nonetheless, I did look forward to each shift. My shift that night had started at the counter, but once the girl working the window ended her shift, I was moved to her station. At the time, I had no preference between counter and window. You came into contact with the rude and crude working both, and this night was no different. I had already had a big fat woman with her three snotty-nosed children in tow scream at me for making a small mistake in her order. Perhaps the only benefit I did have was that I rarely worked after midnight, so I didn't have to deal with many intoxicated customers that came later. The one or two times I did work later, I found it a trying experience. I'll keep my moral views to myself. I will only say that I see those who partake of alcohol as weak, and I'll leave it at that. My shift was ending in around an hour when I met my last customer. From the way the gentleman was speaking, I could tell he had been drinking that evening. The transaction was a string of confusion and chaos. He changed the order multiple times and those in the car with him sounded as confused as him. The entire mess came to a head when I informed him that our shake machine was out of order. I'm aware that most drive through workers will use that as an excuse but I promised that night it was certainly broken. When I told him this, I was assaulted with a tirade of curses and derogatory names, and then he went silent. At first, I believed that there was something amiss with the headset, but I was wrong. The quiet was shattered by the squealing of tires. The cry of the tires was almost instantly joined by the roar of gunfire. I still believe to this day the only thing that saved my life was the sound of the tires. When I heard them, I leaned a bit forward in the window, almost putting my head out of the doors. I had only expected an angry confrontation at that second, but coming face to face with the barrel of his gun as he extended his arm from his window, I instinctively ran for cover. 
The countless bangs from the gun and the screams of my fellow employees seemed to last a lifetime. No matter how I tried to drown them out by covering my head with my arms, they remained just as horrifying. I'm not sure when the firing finally stopped, but I didn't even consider raising my head until another of the employees shook me. I guess at the time he was checking to see if I had been struck by any of the bullets, but regardless of his intent, I hesitated a moment before I sat upright. To my dismay, two of the others working that night had been injured and although neither of them died, I couldn't return to that restaurant or any of its kind for quite some time. Just now, over six months after this happened, can I finally see a business with a drive through window without having a panic attack? In the months since the attack, I have spent a large amount of time and energy in counseling in the hopes of regaining my courage and ability to be a useful member of society again. Whether it's due to feelings of guilt or fear, the road has been a hard one and if it were not for the sense of purpose and the hard work ethic my parents have helped foster in me, I may not have even made it through school. Despite my heartfelt hopes and many prayers, the police have yet to find or arrest the thugs that attempted to take my life because of a freaking shake machine. The best I can do is continue to have faith in law enforcement and the universal force of right. I know someday, some way, they will be made to pay for what they have done. The only real solace I can find is the fact that no one has lost their lives because of something I did or said.